Middlemarch by George Eliot Book 7 Two Temptations Chapter 63 These little things are great to little man. Goldsmith. Have you seen much of your scientific phoenix, Lydgate, lately, said Mr. Toller at one of his Christmas dinner parties, speaking to Mr. Fairbrother on his right hand. Not much, I am sorry to say, answered the vicar, accustomed to parry Mr. Toller's banter about his belief in the new medical light. I am out of the way and he is too busy. Is he? I am glad to hear it, said Dr. Minchin, with mingled suavity and surprise. He gives a great deal of time to the new hospital, said Mr. Fairbrother, who had his reasons for continuing the subject, I hear of that from my neighbor, Mrs. Kasabin, who goes there often. She says Lydgate is indefatigable, and is making a fine thing of Bulstrode's institution. He is preparing a new ward in case of the cholera coming to us. And preparing theories of treatment to try on the patients, I suppose, said Mr. Toller. Come, Toller, be candid, said Mr. Fairbrother. You are too clever not to see the good of a bold fresh mind in medicine, as well as in everything else, and as to cholera, I fancy, none of you are very sure what you ought to do. If a man goes a little too far along a new road, it is usually himself that he harms more than anyone else. I am sure you and Wrench ought to be obliged to him, said Dr. Minchin, looking towards Toller, for he has sent you the cream of Peacock's patients. Lydgate has been living at a great rate for a young beginner, said Mr. Harry Toller, the brewer. I suppose his relations in the North back him up. I hope so, said Mr. Chichley, else he ought not to have married that nice girl we were all so fond of. Hang it, one has a grudge against a man who carries off the prettiest girl in the town. I, by God. And the best too, said Mr. Standish. My friend Vincy didn't half like the marriage, I know that, said Mr. Chichley. He wouldn't do much. How the relations on the other side may have come down I can't say. There was an emphatic kind of reticence in Mr. Chichley's manner of speaking. Oh, I shouldn't think Lydgate ever looked to practice for a living, said Mr. Toller, with a slight touch of sarcasm, and there the subject was dropped. This was not the first time that Mr. Fairbrother had heard hints of Lydgate's expenses being obviously too great to be met by his practice, but he thought it not unlikely that there were resources or expectations which excused the large outlay at the time of Lydgate's marriage, and which might hinder any bad consequences from the disappointment in his practice. One evening, when he took the pains to go to Middlemarch on purpose to have a chat with Lydgate as of old, he noticed in him an air of excited effort quite unlike his usual easy way of keeping silence or breaking it with abrupt energy whenever he had anything to say. Lydgate talked persistently when they were in his workroom, putting arguments for and against the probability of certain biological views, but he had none of those definite things to say or to show which give the waymarks of a patient uninterrupted pursuit, such as he used himself to insist on, saying that, there must be a systole and diastole in all inquiry and that, a man's mind must be continually expanding and shrinking between the whole human horizon and the horizon of an object glass. That evening he seemed to be talking widely for the sake of resisting any personal bearing, and before long they went into the drawing room, where Lydgate, having asked Rosamond to give them music, sank back in his chair in silence. But with a strange light in his eyes. He may have been taking an opiate, was a thought that crossed Mr. Fairbrother's mind, tic douloureux perhaps, or medical worries. It did not occur to him that Lydgate's marriage was not delightful, he believed, as the rest did, that Rosamond was an amiable, docile creature, though he had always thought her rather uninteresting, a little too much the pattern card of the finishing school, and his mother could not forgive Rosamond because she never seemed to see that Henrietta Noble was in the room. However, Lydgate fell in love with her, said the vicar to himself, and she must be to his taste. Mr. Fairbrother was aware that Lydgate was a proud man, but having very little corresponding fibre in himself, and perhaps too little care about personal dignity, except the dignity of not being mean or foolish, he could hardly allow enough for the way in which Lydgate shrank, as from a burn, from the utterance of any word about his private affairs. 
And soon after that conversation at Mr. Toller's, the vicar learned something which made him watch the more eagerly for an opportunity of indirectly letting Lydgate know that if he wanted to open himself about any difficulty there was a friendly ear ready. The opportunity came at Mr. Vincey's, where, on New Year's Day, there was a party, to which Mr. Fairbrother was irresistibly invited, on the plea that he must not forsake his old friends on the first new year of his being a greater man, and rector as well as vicar. And this party was thoroughly friendly, all the ladies of the Fairbrother family were present, the Vincey children all dined at the table, and Fred had persuaded his mother that if she did not invite Mary Garth, the Fairbrothers would regard it as a slight to themselves, Mary being their particular friend. Mary came, and Fred was in high spirits, though his enjoyment was of a checkered kind, triumph that his mother should see Mary's importance with the chief personages in the party being much streaked with jealousy when Mr. Fairbrother sat down by her. Fred used to be much more easy about his own accomplishments in the days when he had not begun to dread being bowled out by Fairbrother, and this terror was still before him. Mrs. Vincey, in her fullest matronly bloom, looked at Mary's little figure, rough wavy hair, and visage quite without lilies and roses, and wondered, trying unsuccessfully to fancy herself caring about Mary's appearance in wedding clothes, or feeling complacency in grandchildren who would feature the Garths. However, the party was a merry one, and Mary was particularly bright, being glad, for Fred's sake, that his friends were getting kinder to her, and being also quite willing that they should see how much she was valued by others whom they must admit to be judges. Mr. Fairbrother noticed that Lydgate seemed bored, and that Mr. Vincey spoke as little as possible to his son-in-law. Rosamond was perfectly graceful and calm, and only a subtle observation such as the vicar had not been roused to bestow on her would have perceived the total absence of that interest in her husband's presence which a loving wife is sure to betray, even if etiquette keeps her aloof from him. When Lydgate was taking part in the conversation, she never looked towards him any more than if she had been a sculptured psyche model to look another way, and when, after being called out for an hour or two, he re-entered the room, she seemed unconscious of the fact, which eighteen months before would have had the effect of a numeral before ciphers. In reality, however, she was intensely aware of Lydgate's voice and movements, and her pretty good-tempered air of unconsciousness was a studied negation by which she satisfied her inward opposition to him without compromise of propriety. When the ladies were in the drawing-room after Lydgate had been called away from the dessert, Mrs. Fair brother, when Rosamond happened to be near her, said, you have to give up a great deal of your husband's society, Mrs. Lydgate. Yes, the life of a medical man is very arduous, especially when he is so devoted to his profession as Mr. Lydgate is, said Rosamond, who was standing, and moved easily away at the end of this correct little speech. It is dreadfully dull for her when there is no company, said Mrs. Vincey, who was seated at the old lady's side. I am sure I thought so when Rosamond was ill, and I was staying with her. You know, Mrs. Fairbrother, ours is a cheerful house. I am of a cheerful disposition myself, and Mr. Vincey always likes something to be going on. That is what Rosamond has been used to. Very different from a husband out at odd hours, and never knowing when he will come home, and of a close, proud disposition, I think, indiscreet Mrs. Vincey did lower her tone slightly with this parenthesis. But Rosamond always had an angel of a temper. Her brothers used very often not to please her, but she was never the girl to show temper, from a baby she was always as good as good, and with a complexion beyond anything. But my children are all good-tempered, thank God. This was easily credible to anyone looking at Mrs. Vincey as she threw back her broad cap strings, and smiled towards her three little girls, aged from seven to eleven. But in that smiling glance she was obliged to include Mary Garth, whom the three girls had got into a corner to make her tell them stories. Mary was just finishing the delicious tale of Rumpelstiltskin, which she had well by heart, because Letty was never tired of communicating it to her ignorant elders from a favorite red volume. Louisa, Mrs. Vincey's darling, now ran to her with wide-eyed serious excitement, crying, Oh mama, mama, the little man stamped so hard on the floor he couldn't get his leg out again. Bless you, my cherub, said Mama, 
you shall tell me all about it tomorrow. Go and listen, and then, as her eyes followed Louisa back towards the attractive corner, she thought that if Fred wished her to invite Mary again she would make no objection, the children being so pleased with her. But presently the corner became still more animated, for Mr. Fairbrother came in, and seating himself behind Louisa, took her on his lap, whereupon the girls all insisted that he must hear Rumpelstiltskin, and Mary must tell it over again. He insisted too, and Mary, without fuss, began again in her neat fashion, with precisely the same words as before. Fred, who had also seated himself near, would have felt unmixed triumph in Mary's effectiveness if Mr. Fairbrother had not been looking at her with evident admiration, while he dramatized an intense interest in the tale to please the children. You will never care any more about my one-eyed giant, Lou, said Fred at the end. Yes, I shall. Tell about him now, said Louisa. Oh, I dare say, I am quite cut out. Ask Mr. Fairbrother. Yes, added Mary, ask Mr. Fairbrother to tell you about the ants whose beautiful house was knocked down by a giant named Tom, and he thought they didn't mind because he couldn't hear them cry, or see them use their pocket handkerchiefs. Please, said Louisa, looking up at the vicar. No, no, I am a grave old parson. If I try to draw a story out of my bag a sermon comes instead. Shall I preach you a sermon, said he, putting on his short-sighted glasses, and pursing up his lips. Yes, said Louisa, falteringly. Let me see, then. Against cakes, how cakes are bad things, especially if they are sweet and have plums in them. Louisa took the affair rather seriously, and got down from the vicar's knee to go to Fred. Ah, I see it will not do to preach on New Year's Day, said Mr. Fairbrother, rising and walking away. He had discovered of late that Fred had become jealous of him, and also that he himself was not losing his preference for Mary above all other women. A delightful young person is Miss Garth, said Mrs. Fairbrother, who had been watching her son's movements. Yes, said Mrs. Vincy, obliged to reply, as the old lady turned to her expectantly. It is a pity she is not better looking. I cannot say that, said Mrs. Fairbrother, decisively. I like her countenance. We must not always ask for beauty, when a good God has seen fit to make an excellent young woman without it. I put good manners first, and Miss Garth will know how to conduct herself in any station. The old lady was a little sharp in her tone, having a prospective reference to Mary's becoming her daughter-in-law for there was this inconvenience in Mary's position with regard to Fred, that it was not suitable to be made public, and hence the three ladies at Lowick Parsonage were still hoping that Camden would choose Miss Garth. New visitors entered, and the drawing room was given up to music and games, while whist tables were prepared in the quiet room on the other side of the hall. Mr. Fairbrother played a rubber to satisfy his mother, who regarded her occasional whist as a protest against scandal and novelty of opinion, in which light even a revoke had its dignity. But at the end he got Mr. Chichley to take his place, and left the room. As he crossed the hall, Lydgate had just come in and was taking off his greatcoat. You are the man I was going to look for, said the vicar, and instead of entering the drawing room, they walked along the hall and stood against the fireplace, where the frosty air helped to make a glowing bank. You see, I can leave the whist table easily enough, he went on, smiling at Lydgate, now I don't play for money. I owe that to you, Mrs. Kasabin says. How, said Lydgate, coldly. Ah, you didn't mean me to know it, I call that ungenerous reticence. You should let a man have the pleasure of feeling that you have done him a good turn. I don't enter into some people's dislike of being under an obligation upon my word, I prefer being under an obligation to everybody for behaving well to me. I can't tell what you mean, said Lydgate, unless it is that I once spoke of you to Mrs. Kasabin. But I did not think that she would break her promise not to mention that I had done so, said Lydgate, leaning his back against the corner of the mantelpiece, and showing no radiance in his face. It was Brooke who let it out, only the other day. 
He paid me the compliment of saying that he was very glad I had the living though you had come across his tactics, and had praised me up as a Ken and a Tillotson, and that sort of thing, till Mrs. Kasabin would hear of no one else. Oh, Brooke is such a leaky-minded fool, said Lydgate, contemptuously. Well, I was glad of the leakiness then. I don't see why you shouldn't like me to know that you wish to do me a service, my dear fellow. And you certainly have done me one. It's rather a strong check to one's self-complacency to find how much of one's right doing depends on not being in want of money. A man will not be tempted to say the Lord's Prayer backward to please the devil, if he doesn't want the devil's services. I have no need to hang on the smiles of chance now. I don't see that there's any money getting without chance, said Lydgate, if a man gets it in a profession, it's pretty sure to come by chance. Mr. Fairbrother thought he could account for this speech, in striking contrast with Lydgate's former way of talking, as the perversity which will often spring from the moodiness of a man ill at ease in his affairs. He answered in a tone of good-humored admission, Ah, there's enormous patience wanted with the way of the world. But it is the easier for a man to wait patiently when he has friends who love him, and ask for nothing better than to help him through, so far as it lies in their power. Oh yes, said Lydgate, in a careless tone, changing his attitude and looking at his watch. People make much more of their difficulties than they need to do. He knew as distinctly as possible that this was an offer of help to himself from Mr. Fairbrother, and he could not bear it. So strangely determined are we mortals, that, after having been long gratified with the sense that he had privately done the vicar a service, the suggestion that the vicar discerned his need of a service in return made him shrink into unconquerable reticence. Besides, behind all making of such offers what else must come, that he should mention his case, imply that he wanted specific things. At that moment, suicide seemed easier. Mr. Fairbrother was too keen a man not to know the meaning of that reply, and there was a certain massiveness in Lydgate's manner and tone, corresponding with his physique, which if he repelled your advances in the first instance seemed to put persuasive devices out of question. What time are you, said the vicar, devouring his wounded feeling. After eleven, said Lydgate. And they went into the drawing room. Chapter 64 First Gent Where lies the power, there let the blame lie too. 2D Gent Nay, power is relative, you cannot fright the coming pest with border fortresses, or catch your carp with subtle argument. All force is twain in one, cause is not cause unless effect be there, and action self must needs contain a passive. So command exists but with obedience. Even if Lydgate had been inclined to be quite open about his affairs, he knew that it would have hardly been in Mr. Fairbrother's power to give him the help he immediately wanted. With the year's bills coming in from his tradesmen, with Dover's threatening hold on his furniture, and with nothing to depend on but slow dribbling payments from patients who must not be offended, for the handsome fees he had had from Freshet Hall and Lowick Manor had been easily absorbed, Nothing less than a thousand pounds would have freed him from actual embarrassment, and left a residue which, according to the favorite phrase of hopefulness in such circumstances, would have given him time to look about him. Naturally, the Merry Christmas bringing the Happy New Year, when fellow citizens expect to be paid for the trouble and goods they have smilingly bestowed on their neighbors, had so tightened the pressure of sordid cares on Lydgate's mind that it was hardly possible for him to think unbrokenly of any other subject, even the most habitual and soliciting. He was not an ill-tempered man, his intellectual activity, the ardent kindness of his heart, as well as his strong frame, would always, under tolerably easy conditions, have kept him above the petty uncontrolled susceptibilities which make bad temper. But he was now a prey to that worst irritation which arises not simply from annoyances, but from the second consciousness underlying those annoyances, of wasted energy and a degrading preoccupation, which was the reverse of all his former purposes. This is what I am thinking of, and that is what I might have been thinking of, was the bitter incessant murmur within him, making every difficulty a double goad to impatience. 
Some gentlemen have made an amazing figure in literature by general discontent with the universe as a trap of dullness into which their great souls have fallen by mistake, but the sense of a stupendous self and an insignificant world may have its consolations. Lydgate's discontent was much harder to bear, it was the sense that there was a grand existence in thought and effective action lying around him, while his self was being narrowed into the miserable isolation of egoistic fears and vulgar anxieties for events that might allay such fears. His troubles will perhaps appear miserably sordid, and beneath the attention of lofty persons who can know nothing of debt except on a magnificent scale. Doubtless they were sordid, and for the majority, who are not lofty, there is no escape from sordidness but by being free from money craving, with all its base hopes and temptations, its watching for death, its hinted requests, its horse dealer's desire to make bad work pass for good, its seeking for function which ought to be another's, its compulsion often to long for luck in the shape of a wide calamity. It was because Lydgate writhed under the idea of getting his neck beneath this vile yoke that he had fallen into a bitter moody state which was continually widening Rosamond's alienation from him. After the first disclosure about the bill of sale, he had made many efforts to draw her into sympathy with him about possible measures for narrowing their expenses, and with the threatening approach of Christmas his propositions grew more and more definite. We too can do with only one servant, and live on very little, he said, and I shall manage with one horse. For Lydgate, as we have seen, had begun to reason, with a more distinct vision, about the expenses of living, and any share of pride he had given to appearances of that sort was meager compared with the pride which made him revolt from exposure as a debtor, or from asking men to help him with their money. Of course you can dismiss the other two servants, if you like, said Rosamond, but I should have thought it would be very injurious to your position for us to live in a poor way. You must expect your practice to be lowered. My dear Rosamond, it is not a question of choice. We have begun too expensively. Peacock, you know, lived in a much smaller house than this. It is my fault, I ought to have known better, and I deserve a thrashing, if there were anybody who had a right to give it me, for bringing you into the necessity of living in a poorer way than you have been used to. But we married because we loved each other, I suppose. And that may help us to pull along till things get better. Come, dear, put down that work and come to me. He was really in chill gloom about her at that moment, but he dreaded a future without affection, and was determined to resist the oncoming of division between them. Rosamond obeyed him, and he took her on his knee, but in her secret soul she was utterly aloof from him. The poor thing saw only that the world was not ordered to her liking, and Lydgate was part of that world. But he held her waist with one hand and laid the other gently on both of hers, for this rather abrupt man had much tenderness in his manners towards women, seeming to have always present in his imagination the weakness of their frames and the delicate poise of their health both in body and mind. And he began again to speak persuasively. I find, now I look into things a little, rosy, that it is wonderful what an amount of money slips away in our housekeeping. I suppose the servants are careless, and we have had a great many people coming. But there must be many in our rank who manage with much less, they must do with commoner things, I suppose, and look after the scraps. It seems, money goes but a little way in these matters, for Wrench has everything as plain as possible, and he has a very large practice. Oh, if you think of living as the wrenches do, said Rosamond, with a little turn of her neck. But I have heard you express your disgust at that way of living. Yes. They have bad taste in everything, they make economy look ugly. We needn't do that. I only meant that they avoid expenses, although Wrench has a capital practice. Why should not you have a good practice, Tertius? Mr. Peacock had. You should be more careful not to offend people, and you should send out medicines as the others do. I am sure you began well, and you got several good houses. It cannot answer to be eccentric, you should think what will be generally liked, said Rosamond, in a decided little tone of admonition. Lydgate's anger rose, he was prepared to be indulgent towards feminine weakness, but not towards feminine dictation. 
The shallowness of a Waternixie's soul may have a charm until she becomes didactic. But he controlled himself, and only said, with a touch of despotic firmness, what I am to do in my practice, Rosie, it is for me to judge. That is not the question between us. It is enough for you to know that our income is likely to be a very narrow one, hardly four hundred, perhaps less, for a long time to come, and we must try to rearrange our lives in accordance with that fact. Rosamond was silent for a moment or two, looking before her, and then said, My uncle Bolstrode ought to allow you a salary for the time you give to the hospital, it is not right that you should work for nothing. It was understood from the beginning that my services would be gratuitous. That, again, need not enter into our discussion. I have pointed out what is the only probability, said Lydgate, impatiently. Then checking himself, he went on more quietly, I think I see one resource which would free us from a good deal of the present difficulty. I hear that young Ned Plymdale is going to be married to Miss Sophie Toller. They are rich, and it is not often that a good house is vacant in Middlemarch. I feel sure that they would be glad to take this house from us with most of our furniture, and they would be willing to pay handsomely for the lease. I can employ Trumbull to speak to Plymdale about it. Rosamond left her husband's knee and walked slowly to the other end of the room, when she turned round and walked towards him it was evident that the tears had come, and that she was biting her underlip and clasping her hands to keep herself from crying. Lydgate was wretched, shaken with anger and yet feeling that it would be unmanly to vent the anger just now. I am very sorry, Rosamond, I know this is painful. I thought, at least, when I had borne to send the plate back and have that man taking an inventory of the furniture, I should have thought that would suffice. I explained it to you at the time, dear. That was only a security and behind that security there is a debt. And that debt must be paid within the next few months, else we shall have our furniture sold. If young Plymdale will take our house and most of our furniture, we shall be able to pay that debt, and some others too, and we shall be quit of a place too expensive for us. We might take a smaller house, Trumbull, I know, has a very decent one to let at thirty pounds a year, and this is ninety. Lydgate uttered this speech in the curt hammering way with which we usually try to nail down a vague mind to imperative facts. Tears rolled silently down Rosamond's cheeks, she just pressed her handkerchief against them, and stood looking at the large vase on the mantelpiece. It was a moment of more intense bitterness than she had ever felt before. At last she said, without hurry and with careful emphasis, I never could have believed that you would like to act in that way. Like it, burst out Lydgate, rising from his chair, thrusting his hands in his pockets and stalking away from the hearth, it's not a question of liking. Of course, I don't like it, it's the only thing I can do. He wheeled round there, and turned towards her. I should have thought there were many other means than that, said Rosamond. Let us have a sail and leave Middlemarch altogether. To do what? What is the use of my leaving my work in Middlemarch to go where I have none? We should be just as penniless elsewhere as we are here, said Lydgate still more angrily. If we are to be in that position it will be entirely your own doing, Tertius, said Rosamond, turning round to speak with the fullest conviction. You will not behave as you ought to do to your own family. You offended Captain Lydgate. Sir Godwin was very kind to me when we were at Qualingham, and I am sure if you showed proper regard to him and told him your affairs, he would do anything for you. But rather than that, you like giving up our house and furniture to Mr. Ned Plymdale. There was something like fierceness in Lydgate's eyes, as he answered with new violence, Well, then, if you will have it so, I do like it. I admit that I like it better than making a fool of myself by going to beg where it's of no use. Understand then, that it is what I like to do. There was a tone in the last sentence which was equivalent to the clutch of his strong hand on Rosamond's delicate arm. But for all that, his will was not a whit stronger than hers. She immediately walked out of the room in silence, but with an intense determination to hinder what Lydgate liked to do. He went out of the house, 
but as his blood cooled he felt that the chief result of the discussion was a deposit of dread within him at the idea of opening with his wife in future subjects which might again urge him to violent speech. It was as if a fracture in delicate crystal had begun, and he was afraid of any movement that might make it fatal. His marriage would be a mere piece of bitter irony if they could not go on loving each other. He had long ago made up his mind to what he thought was her negative character, her want of sensibility, which showed itself in disregard both of his specific wishes and of his general aims. The first great disappointment had been born, the tender devotedness and docile adoration of the ideal wife must be renounced, and life must be taken up on a lower stage of expectation, as it is by men who have lost their limbs. But the real wife had not only her claims, she had still a hold on his heart, and it was his intense desire that the hold should remain strong. In marriage, the certainty, she will never love me much, is easier to bear than the fear, I shall love her no more. Hence, after that outburst, his inward effort was entirely to excuse her, and to blame the hard circumstances which were partly his fault. He tried that evening, by petting her, to heal the wound he had made in the morning, and it was not in Rosamond's nature to be repellent or sulky, indeed, she welcomed the signs that her husband loved her and was under control. But this was something quite distinct from loving him. Lydgate would not have chosen soon to recur to the plan of parting with the house, he was resolved to carry it out, and say as little more about it as possible. But Rosamond herself touched on it at breakfast by saying, mildly, have you spoken to Trumbull yet? No, said Lydgate, but I shall call on him as I go by this morning. No time must be lost. He took Rosamond's question as a sign that she withdrew her inward opposition, and kissed her head caressingly when he got up to go away. As soon as it was late enough to make a call, Rosamond went to Mrs. Plymdale, Mr. Ned's mother, and entered with pretty congratulations into the subject of the coming marriage. Mrs. Plymdale's maternal view was, that Rosamond might possibly now have retrospective glimpses of her own folly, and feeling the advantages to be at present all on the side of her son, was too kind a woman not to behave graciously. Yes, Ned is most happy, I must say. And Sophie Toller is all I could desire in a daughter-in-law. Of course her father is able to do something handsome for her, that is only what would be expected with a brewery like his. And the connection is everything we should desire. But that is not what I look at. She is such a very nice girl, no airs, no pretensions, though on a level with the first. I don't mean with the titled aristocracy. I see very little good in people aiming out of their own sphere. I mean that Sophie is equal to the best in the town, and she is contented with that. I have always thought her very agreeable, said Rosamond. I look upon it as a reward for Ned, who never held his head too high, that he should have got into the very best connection, continued Mrs. Plymdale, her native sharpness softened by a fervid sense that she was taking a correct view. And such particular people as the Tollers are, they might have objected because some of our friends are not theirs. It is well known that your Aunt Bulstrode and I have been intimate from our youth, and Mr. Plymdale has been always on Mr. Bulstrode's side. And I myself prefer serious opinions. But the Tollers have welcomed Ned all the same. I am sure he is a very deserving, well-principled young man, said Rosamond, with a neat air of patronage in return for Mrs. Plymdale's wholesome corrections. Oh, he has not the style of a captain in the army, or that sort of carriage as if everybody was beneath him, or that showy kind of talking, and singing, and intellectual talent. But I am thankful he has not. It is a poor preparation both for here and hereafter. Oh dear, yes, appearances have very little to do with happiness, said Rosamond. I think there is every prospect of their being a happy couple. What house will they take? Oh, as for that, they must put up with what they can get. They have been looking at the house in St. Peter's Place, next to Mr. Hackbutt's, it belongs to him, and he is putting it nicely in repair. I suppose they are not likely to hear of a better. Indeed, I think Ned will decide the matter today. I should think it is a nice house, I like St. Peter's Place. 
well, it is near the church, and a genteel situation. But the windows are narrow, and it is all ups and downs. You don't happen to know of any other that would be at liberty, said Mrs. Plymdale, fixing her round black eyes on Rosamond with the animation of a sudden thought in them. Oh no, I hear so little of those things. Rosamond had not foreseen that question and answer in setting out to pay her visit, she had simply meant to gather any information which would help her to avert the parting with her own house under circumstances thoroughly disagreeable to her. As to the untruth in her reply, she no more reflected on it than she did on the untruth there was in her saying that appearances had very little to do with happiness. Her object, she was convinced, was thoroughly justifiable, it was Lydgate whose intention was inexcusable, and there was a plan in her mind which, when she had carried it out fully, would prove how very false a step it would have been for him to have descended from his position. She returned home by Mr. Borthrop Trumbull's office, meaning to call there. It was the first time in her life that Rosamond had thought of doing anything in the form of business, but she felt equal to the occasion. That she should be obliged to do what she intensely disliked, was an idea which turned her quiet tenacity into active invention. Here was a case in which it could not be enough simply to disobey and be serenely, placidly obstinate, she must act according to her judgment, and she said to herself that her judgment was right, indeed, if it had not been, she would not have wished to act on it. Mr. Trumbull was in the back room of his office, and received Rosamond with his finest manners, not only because he had much sensibility to her charms, but because the good-natured fibre in him was stirred by his certainty that Lydgate was in difficulties, and that this uncommonly pretty woman, this young lady with the highest personal attractions, was likely to feel the pinch of trouble, to find herself involved in circumstances beyond her control. He begged her to do him the honour to take a seat, and stood before her trimming and comporting himself with an eager solicitude, which was chiefly benevolent. Rosamond's first question was, whether her husband had called on Mr. Trumbull that morning, to speak about disposing of their house. Yes, ma'am, yes, he did, he did so, said the good auctioneer, trying to throw something soothing into his iteration. I was about to fulfill his order, if possible, this afternoon. He wished me not to procrastinate. I called to tell you not to go any further, Mr. Trumbull, and I beg of you not to mention what has been said on the subject. Will you oblige me? Certainly I will, Mrs. Lydgate, certainly. Confidence is sacred with me on business or any other topic. I am then to consider the commission withdrawn, said Mr. Trumbull, adjusting the long ends of his blue cravat with both hands, and looking at Rosamond deferentially. Yes, if you please. I find that Mr. Ned Plymdale has taken a house, the one in St. Peter's Place next to Mr. Hackbutt's. Mr. Lydgate would be annoyed that his orders should be fulfilled uselessly. And besides that, there are other circumstances which render the proposal unnecessary. Very good, Mrs. Lydgate, very good. I am at your commands, whenever you require any service of me, said Mr. Trumbull, who felt pleasure in conjecturing that some new resources had been opened. Rely on me, I beg. The affair shall go no further. That evening Lydgate was a little comforted by observing that Rosamond was more lively than she had usually been of late, and even seemed interested in doing what would please him without being asked. He thought, if she will be happy and I can rub through, what does it all signify? It is only a narrow swamp that we have to pass in a long journey. If I can get my mind clear again, I shall do. He was so much cheered that he began to search for an account of experiments which he had long ago meant to look up, and had neglected out of that creeping self-despair which comes in the train of petty anxieties. He felt again some of the old delightful absorption in a far-reaching inquiry, while Rosamond played the quiet music which was as helpful to his meditation as the plash of an oar on the evening lake. It was rather late, he had pushed away all the books, and was looking at the fire with his hands clasped behind his head in forgetfulness of everything except the construction of a new controlling experiment, when Rosamond, who had left the piano and was leaning back in her chair watching him, said, Mr. Ned Plymdale has taken a house already. 
Lydgate, startled and Jared, looked up in silence for a moment, like a man who has been disturbed in his sleep. Then flushing with an unpleasant consciousness, he asked, How do you know? I called at Mrs. Plymdale's this morning, and she told me that he had taken the house in St. Peter's Place, next to Mr. Hackbutt's. Lydgate was silent. He drew his hands from behind his head and pressed them against the hair which was hanging, as it was apt to do, in a mass on his forehead, while he rested his elbows on his knees. He was feeling bitter disappointment, as if he had opened a door out of a suffocating place and had found it walled up, but he also felt sure that Rosamond was pleased with the cause of his disappointment. He preferred not looking at her and not speaking, until he had got over the first spasm of vexation. After all, he said in his bitterness, what can a woman care about so much as house and furniture? A husband without them is an absurdity. When he looked up and pushed his hair aside, his dark eyes had a miserable blank non-expectance of sympathy in them, but he only said, coolly, perhaps someone else may turn up. I told Trumbull to be on the lookout if he failed with Plymdale. Rosamond made no remark. She trusted to the chance that nothing more would pass between her husband and the auctioneer until some issue should have justified her interference, at any rate, she had hindered the event which she immediately dreaded. After a pause, she said, How much money is it that those disagreeable people want? What disagreeable people? Those who took the list, and the others. I mean, how much money would satisfy them so that you need not be troubled any more? Lydgate surveyed her for a moment, as if he were looking for symptoms, and then said, Oh, if I could have got six hundred from Plymdale for furniture and as premium, I might have managed. I could have paid off Dover, and given enough on account to the others to make them wait patiently, if we contracted our expenses. But I mean how much should you want if we stayed in this house? More than I am likely to get anywhere, said Lydgate, with rather a grating sarcasm in his tone. It angered him to perceive that Rosamond's mind was wandering over impracticable wishes instead of facing possible efforts. Why should you not mention the sum, said Rosamond, with a mild indication that she did not like his manners. Well, said Lydgate in a guessing tone, it would take at least a thousand to set me at ease. But, he added, incisively, I have to consider what I shall do without it, not with it. Rosamond said no more. But the next day she carried out her plan of writing to Sir Godwin Lydgate. Since the captain's visit, she had received a letter from him, and also one from Mrs. Mengon, his married sister, condoling with her on the loss of her baby, and expressing vaguely the hope that they should see her again at Qualingham. Lydgate had told her that this politeness meant nothing but she was secretly convinced that any backwardness in Lydgate's family towards him was due to his cold and contemptuous behavior, and she had answered the letters in her most charming manner, feeling some confidence that a specific invitation would follow. But there had been total silence. The captain evidently was not a great penman, and Rosamond reflected that the sisters might have been abroad. However, the season was come for thinking of friends at home, and at any rate Sir Godwin, who had chucked her under the chin, and pronounced her to be like the celebrated beauty, Mrs. Crowley, who had made a conquest of him in 1790, would be touched by any appeal from her, and would find it pleasant for her sake to behave as he ought to do towards his nephew. Rosamond was naively convinced of what an old gentleman ought to do to prevent her from suffering annoyance. And she wrote what she considered the most judicious letter possible, one which would strike Sir Godwin as a proof of her excellent sense, pointing out how desirable it was that Tertius should quit such a place as Middlemarch for one more fitted to his talents, how the unpleasant character of the inhabitants had hindered his professional success, and how in consequence he was in money difficulties, from which it would require a thousand pounds thoroughly to extricate him. She did not say that Tertius was unaware of her intention to write, for she had the idea that his supposed sanction of her letter would be in accordance with what she did say of his great regard for his uncle Godwin as the relative who had always been his best friend. Such was the force of poor Rosamond's tactics now she applied them to affairs. This had happened before the party on New Year's Day, and no answer had yet come from Sir Godwin. 
But on the morning of that day Lydgate had to learn that Rosamond had revoked his order to Borthrop Trumbull. Feeling it necessary that she should be gradually accustomed to the idea of their quitting the house in Lowick Gate, he overcame his reluctance to speak to her again on the subject, and when they were breakfasting said, I shall try to see Trumbull this morning, and tell him to advertise the house in the Pioneer and the Trumpet. If the thing were advertised, someone might be inclined to take it who would not otherwise have thought of a change. In these country places many people go on in their old houses when their families are too large for them, for want of knowing where they can find another. And Trumbull seems to have got no bite at all. Rosamond knew that the inevitable moment was come. I ordered Trumbull not to inquire further, she said, with a careful calmness which was evidently defensive. Lydgate stared at her in mute amazement. Only half an hour before he had been fastening up her plates for her, and talking the little language of affection, which Rosamond, though not returning it, accepted as if she had been a serene and lovely image, now and then miraculously dimpling towards her votary. With such fibres still astir in him, the shock he received could not at once be distinctly anger, it was confused pain. He laid down the knife and fork with which he was carving, and throwing himself back in his chair, said at last, with a cool irony in his tone, may I ask when and why you did so? When I knew that the Plymdales had taken a house, I called to tell him not to mention ours to them, and at the same time I told him not to let the affair go on any further. I knew that it would be very injurious to you if it were known that you wished to part with your house and furniture, and I had a very strong objection to it. I think that was reason enough. It was of no consequence then that I had told you imperative reasons of another kind, of no consequence that I had come to a different conclusion, and given an order accordingly, said Lydgate, bitingly, the thunder and lightning gathering about his brow and eyes. The effect of any one's anger on Rosamond had always been to make her shrink in cold dislike, and to become all the more calmly correct, in the conviction that she was not the person to misbehave whatever others might do. She replied, I think I had a perfect right to speak on a subject which concerns me at least as much as you. Clearly, you had a right to speak, but only to me. You had no right to contradict my orders secretly, and treat me as if I were a fool, said Lydgate, in the same tone as before. Then with some added scorn, is it possible to make you understand what the consequences will be? Is it of any use for me to tell you again why we must try to part with the house? It is not necessary for you to tell me again, said Rosamond, in a voice that fell and trickled like cold water drops. I remembered what you said. You spoke just as violently as you do now. But that does not alter my opinion that you ought to try every other means rather than take a step which is so painful to me. And as to advertising the house, I think it would be perfectly degrading to you. And suppose I disregard your opinion as you disregard mine? You can do so, of course. But I think you ought to have told me before we were married that you would place me in the worst position, rather than give up your own will. Lydgate did not speak, but tossed his head on one side, and twitched the corners of his mouth in despair. Rosamond, seeing that he was not looking at her, rose and set his cup of coffee before him, but he took no notice of it, and went on with an inward drama and argument, occasionally moving in his seat, resting one arm on the table, and rubbing his hand against his hair. There was a conflux of emotions and thoughts in him that would not let him either give thorough way to his anger or persevere with simple rigidity of resolve. Rosamond took advantage of his silence. When we were married everyone felt that your position was very high. I could not have imagined then that you would want to sell our furniture, and take a house in Bride Street, where the rooms are like cages. If we are to live in that way let us at least leave Middlemarch. These would be very strong considerations, said Lydgate, half ironically, still there was a withered paleness about his lips as he looked at his coffee, and did not drink, these would be very strong considerations if I did not happen to be in debt. Many persons must have been in debt in the same way, but if they are respectable, people trust them. I am sure I have heard Papa say that the Torbits were in debt, and they went on very well. It cannot be good to act rashly, 
said Rosamond, with serene wisdom. Lydgate sat paralyzed by opposing impulses, since no reasoning he could apply to Rosamond seemed likely to conquer her assent, he wanted to smash and grind some object on which he could at least produce an impression, or else to tell her brutally that he was master, and she must obey. But he not only dreaded the effect of such extremities on their mutual life, he had a growing dread of Rosamond's quiet elusive obstinacy, which would not allow any assertion of power to be final, and again, she had touched him in a spot of keenest feeling by implying that she had been deluded with a false vision of happiness in marrying him. As to saying that he was master, it was not the fact. The very resolution to which he had wrought himself by dint of logic and honorable pride was beginning to relax under her torpedo contact. He swallowed half his cup of coffee, and then rose to go. I may at least request that you will not go to Trumbull at present, until it has been seen that there are no other means, said Rosamond. Although she was not subject to much fear, she felt it safer not to betray that she had written to Sir Godwin. Promise me that you will not go to him for a few weeks, or without telling me. Lydgate gave a short laugh. I think it is I who should exact a promise that you will do nothing without telling me, he said, turning his eyes sharply upon her, and then moving to the door. You remember that we are going to dine at Papa's, said Rosamond, wishing that he should turn and make a more thorough concession to her. But he only said, oh yes, impatiently, and went away. She held it to be very odious in him that he did not think the painful propositions he had had to make to her were enough, without showing so unpleasant a temper. And when she put the moderate request that he would defer going to Trumbull again, it was cruel in him not to assure her of what he meant to do. She was convinced of her having acted in every way for the best, and each grating or angry speech of Lydgate's served only as an addition to the register of offenses in her mind. Poor Rosamond for months had begun to associate her husband with feelings of disappointment, and the terribly inflexible relation of marriage had lost its charm of encouraging delightful dreams. It had freed her from the disagreeables of her father's house, but it had not given her everything that she had wished and hoped. The Lydgate with whom she had been in love had been a group of airy conditions for her, most of which had disappeared, while their place had been taken by everyday details which must be lived through slowly from hour to hour, not floated through with a rapid selection of favorable aspects. The habits of Lydgate's profession, his home preoccupation with scientific subjects, which seemed to her almost like a morbid vampire's taste, his peculiar views of things which had never entered into the dialogue of courtship, all these continually alienating influences, even without the fact of his having placed himself at a disadvantage in the town, and without that first shock of revelation about Dover's debt, would have made his presence dull to her. There was another presence which ever since the early days of her marriage, until four months ago, had been an agreeable excitement, but that was gone, Rosamond would not confess to herself how much the consequent blank had to do with her utter ennui, and it seemed to her, perhaps she was right, that an invitation to Qualingham, and an opening for Lydgate to settle elsewhere than in Middlemarch, in London, or somewhere likely to be free from unpleasantness, would satisfy her quite well, and make her indifferent to the absence of Will Ladislaw, towards whom she felt some resentment for his exaltation of Mrs. Kasabin. That was the state of things with Lydgate and Rosamond on the New Year's Day when they dined at her father's, she looking mildly neutral towards him in remembrance of his ill-tempered behavior at breakfast, and he carrying a much deeper effect from the inward conflict in which that morning scene was only one of many epochs. His flushed effort while talking to Mr. Fairbrother, his effort after the cynical pretense that all ways of getting money are essentially the same, and that chance has an empire which reduces choice to a fool's illusion, was but the symptom of a wavering resolve, a benumbed response to the old stimuli of enthusiasm. What was he to do? He saw even more keenly than Rosamond did the dreariness of taking her into the small house in Bride Street, where she would have scanty furniture around her and discontent within, a life of privation and life with Rosamond were two images which had become more and more irreconcilable ever since the threat of privation had disclosed itself. But even if his resolves had forced the two images into combination, 
the useful preliminaries to that hard change were not visibly within reach. And though he had not given the promise which his wife had asked for, he did not go again to Trumbull. He even began to think of taking a rapid journey to the north and seeing Sir Godwin. He had once believed that nothing would urge him into making an application for money to his uncle, but he had not then known the full pressure of alternatives yet more disagreeable. He could not depend on the effect of a letter, it was only in an interview, however disagreeable this might be to himself, that he could give a thorough explanation and could test the effectiveness of kinship. No sooner had Lydgate begun to represent this step to himself as the easiest than there was a reaction of anger that he, he who had long ago determined to live aloof from such abject calculations, such self-interested anxiety about the inclinations and the pockets of men with whom he had been proud to have no aims in common, should have fallen not simply to their level, but to the level of soliciting them. Chapter 65 One of us two must bowen doubtless, and, sith a man is more reasonable than woman is, ye, men, most be sufferable. Chaucer, Canterbury Tales the bias of human nature to be slow in correspondence triumphs even over the present quickening in the general pace of things, what wonder then that in 1832 old Sir Godwin Lydgate was slow to write a letter which was of consequence to others rather than to himself. Nearly three weeks of the new year were gone, and Rosamond, awaiting an answer to her winning appeal, was every day disappointed. Lydgate, in total ignorance of her expectations, was seeing the bills come in, and feeling that Dover's use of his advantage over other creditors was imminent. He had never mentioned to Rosamond his brooding purpose of going to Qualingham, he did not want to admit what would appear to her a concession to her wishes after indignant refusal, until the last moment, but he was really expecting to set off soon. A slice of the railway would enable him to manage the whole journey and back in four days. But one morning after Lydgate had gone out, a letter came addressed to him, which Rosamond saw clearly to be from Sir Godwin. She was full of hope. Perhaps there might be a particular note to her enclosed, but Lydgate was naturally addressed on the question of money or other aid, and the fact that he was written to, nay, the very delay in writing at all, seemed to certify that the answer was thoroughly compliant. She was too much excited by these thoughts to do anything but light stitching in a warm corner of the dining room, with the outside of this momentous letter lying on the table before her. About twelve she heard her husband step in the passage, and tripping to open the door, she said in her lightest tones, Tertius, come in here, here is a letter for you. Ah, he said, not taking off his hat, but just turning her round within his arm to walk towards the spot where the letter lay. My uncle Godwin, he exclaimed, while Rosamond reseated herself, and watched him as he opened the letter. She had expected him to be surprised. While Lydgate's eyes glanced rapidly over the brief letter, she saw his face, usually of a pale brown, taking on a dry whiteness, with nostrils and lips quivering he tossed down the letter before her, and said violently, It will be impossible to endure life with you, if you will always be acting secretly, acting in opposition to me and hiding your actions. He checked his speech and turned his back on her, then wheeled round and walked about, sat down, and got up again restlessly, grasping hard the objects deep down in his pockets. He was afraid of saying something irremediably cruel. Rosamond too had changed color as she read. The letter ran in this way, Dear Tertius, don't set your wife to write to me when you have anything to ask. It is a roundabout wheedling sort of thing which I should not have credited you with. I never choose to write to a woman on matters of business. As to my supplying you with a thousand pounds, or only half that sum, I can do nothing of the sort. My own family drains me to the last penny. With two younger sons and three daughters, I am not likely to have cash to spare. You seem to have got through your own money pretty quickly, and to have made a mess where you are, the sooner you go somewhere else the better. But I have nothing to do with men of your profession, and can't help you there. I did the best I could for you as guardian, and let you have your own way in taking to medicine. You might have gone into the army or the church. Your money would have held out for that, and there would have been a surer ladder before you. 
Your uncle Charles has had a grudge against you for not going into his profession, but not I. I have always wished you well, but you must consider yourself on your own legs entirely now. Your affectionate uncle, Godwin Lydgate. When Rosamond had finished reading the letter she sat quite still, with her hands folded before her, restraining any show of her keen disappointment, and entrenching herself in quiet passivity under her husband's wrath. Lydgate paused in his movements, looked at her again, and said, with biting severity, will this be enough to convince you of the harm you may do by secret meddling? Have you sense enough to recognize now your incompetence to judge and act for me, to interfere with your ignorance in affairs which it belongs to me to decide on? The words were hard, but this was not the first time that Lydgate had been frustrated by her. She did not look at him, and made no reply. I had nearly resolved on going to Qualingham. It would have cost me pain enough to do it, yet it might have been of some use. But it has been of no use for me to think of anything. You have always been counteracting me secretly. You delude me with a false assent, and then I am at the mercy of your devices. If you mean to resist every wish I express, say so and defy me. I shall at least know what I am doing then. It is a terrible moment in young lives when the closeness of love's bond has turned to this power of galling. In spite of Rosamond's self-control a tear fell silently and rolled over her lips. She still said nothing, but under that quietude was hidden an intense effect, she was in such entire disgust with her husband that she wished she had never seen him. Sir Godwin's rudeness towards her and utter want of feeling ranged him with Dover and all other creditors, disagreeable people who only thought of themselves, and did not mind how annoying they were to her. Even her father was unkind, and might have done more for them. In fact there was but one person in Rosamond's world whom she did not regard as blameworthy, and that was the graceful creature with blonde plates and with little hands crossed before her, who had never expressed herself unbecomingly, and had always acted for the best, the best naturally being what she best liked. Lydgate pausing and looking at her began to feel that half-maddening sense of helplessness which comes over passionate people when their passion is met by an innocent-looking silence whose meek victimized air seems to put them in the wrong, and at last infects even the justest indignation with a doubt of its justice. He needed to recover the full sense that he was in the right by moderating his words. Can you not see, Rosamond, he began again, trying to be simply grave and not bitter, that nothing can be so fatal as a want of openness and confidence between us? It has happened again and again that I have expressed a decided wish, and you have seemed to assent, yet after that you have secretly disobeyed my wish. In that way I can never know what I have to trust to. There would be some hope for us if you would admit this. Am I such an unreasonable, furious brute? Why should you not be open with me? Still silence. Will you only say that you have been mistaken, and that I may depend on your not acting secretly in future, said Lydgate, urgently, but with something of request in his tone which Rosamond was quick to perceive. She spoke with coolness. I cannot possibly make admissions or promises in answer to such words as you have used towards me. I have not been accustomed to language of that kind. You have spoken of my secret meddling, and my interfering ignorance, and my false assent. I have never expressed myself in that way to you, and I think that you ought to apologize. You spoke of its being impossible to live with me. Certainly you have not made my life pleasant to me of late. I think it was to be expected that I should try to avert some of the hardships which our marriage has brought on me. Another tear fell as Rosamond ceased speaking, and she pressed it away as quietly as the first. Lydgate flung himself into a chair, feeling checkmated. What place was there in her mind for a remonstrance to lodge in? He laid down his hat, flung an arm over the back of his chair, and looked down for some moments without speaking. Rosamond had the double purchase over him of insensibility to the point of justice in his reproach, and of sensibility to the undeniable hardships now present in her married life. Although her duplicity in the affair of the house had exceeded what he knew, and had really hindered the Plymdales from knowing of it, she had no consciousness that her action could rightly be called false. 
We are not obliged to identify our own acts according to a strict classification, any more than the materials of our grocery and clothes. Rosamond felt that she was aggrieved, and that this was what Lydgate had to recognize. As for him, the need of accommodating himself to her nature, which was inflexible in proportion to its negations, held him as with pincers. He had begun to have an alarmed foresight of her irrevocable loss of love for him, and the consequent dreariness of their life. The ready fullness of his emotions made this dread alternate quickly with the first violent movements of his anger. It would assuredly have been a vain boast in him to say that he was her master. You have not made my life pleasant to me of late, the hardships which our marriage has brought on me, these words were stinging his imagination as a pain makes an exaggerated dream. If he were not only to sink from his highest resolve, but to sink into the hideous fettering of domestic hate? Rosamond, he said, turning his eyes on her with a melancholy look, you should allow for a man's words when he is disappointed and provoked. You and I cannot have opposite interests. I cannot part my happiness from yours. If I am angry with you, it is that you seem not to see how any concealment divides us. How could I wish to make anything hard to you either by my words or conduct? When I hurt you, I hurt part of my own life. I should never be angry with you if you would be quite open with me. I have only wished to prevent you from hurrying us into wretchedness without any necessity, said Rosamond, the tears coming again from a softened feeling now that her husband had softened. It is so very hard to be disgraced here among all the people we know, and to live in such a miserable way. I wish I had died with the baby. She spoke and wept with that gentleness which makes such words and tears omnipotent over a loving-hearted man. Lydgate drew his chair near to hers and pressed her delicate head against his cheek with his powerful tender hand. He only caressed her, he did not say anything, for what was there to say? He could not promise to shield her from the dreaded wretchedness, for he could see no sure means of doing so. When he left her to go out again, he told himself that it was ten times harder for her than for him, he had a life away from home, and constant appeals to his activity on behalf of others. He wished to excuse everything in her if he could, but it was inevitable that in that excusing mood he should think of her as if she were an animal of another and feebler species. Nevertheless she had mastered him. Chapter 66 Tis one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. Measure for measure. Lydgate certainly had good reason to reflect on the service his practice did him in counteracting his personal cares. He had no longer free energy enough for spontaneous research and speculative thinking, but by the bedside of patience, the direct external calls on his judgment and sympathies brought the added impulse needed to draw him out of himself. It was not simply that beneficent harness of routine which enables silly men to live respectably and unhappy men to live calmly, it was a perpetual claim on the immediate fresh application of thought, and on the consideration of another's need and trial. Many of us looking back through life would say that the kindest man we have ever known has been a medical man, or perhaps that surgeon whose fine tact, directed by deeply informed perception, has come to us in our need with a more sublime beneficence than that of miracle workers. Some of that twice-blessed mercy was always with Lydgate in his work at the hospital or in private houses, serving better than any opiate to quiet and sustain him under his anxieties and his sense of mental degeneracy. Mr. Fairbrother's suspicion as to the opiate was true, however. Under the first galling pressure of foreseen difficulties, and the first perception that his marriage, if it were not to be a yoked loneliness, must be a state of effort to go on loving without too much care about being loved, he had once or twice tried a dose of opium. But he had no hereditary constitutional craving after such transient escapes from the hauntings of misery. He was strong, could drink a great deal of wine, but did not care about it, and when the men round him were drinking spirits, he took sugar and water, having a contemptuous pity even for the earliest stages of excitement from drink. It was the same with gambling. He had looked on at a great deal of gambling in Paris, watching it as if it had been a disease. He was no more tempted by such winning than he was by drink. 
He had said to himself that the only winning he cared for must be attained by a conscious process of high, difficult combination tending towards a beneficent result. The power he longed for could not be represented by agitated fingers clutching a heap of coin, or by the half-barbarous, half-idiotic triumph in the eyes of a man who sweeps within his arms the ventures of twenty chapfallen companions. But just as he had tried opium, so his thought now began to turn upon gambling, not with appetite for its excitement, but with a sort of wistful inward gaze after that easy way of getting money, which implied no asking and brought no responsibility. If he had been in London or Paris at that time, it is probable that such thoughts, seconded by opportunity, would have taken him into a gambling house, no longer to watch the gamblers, but to watch with them in kindred eagerness. Repugnance would have been surmounted by the immense need to win, if chance would be kind enough to let him. An incident which happened not very long after that airy notion of getting aid from his uncle had been excluded, was a strong sign of the effect that might have followed any extant opportunity of gambling. The billiard room at the Green Dragon was the constant resort of a certain set, most of whom, like our acquaintance Mr. Bambridge, were regarded as men of pleasure. It was here that poor Fred Vincey had made part of his memorable debt, having lost money in betting, and been obliged to borrow of that gay companion. It was generally known in Middlemarch that a good deal of money was lost and won in this way, and the consequent repute of the Green Dragon as a place of dissipation naturally heightened in some quarters the temptation to go there. Probably its regular visitants, like the initiates of Freemasonry, wished that there were something a little more tremendous to keep to themselves concerning it, but they were not a closed community, and many decent seniors as well as juniors occasionally turned into the billiard room to see what was going on. Lydgate, who had the muscular aptitude for billiards, and was fond of the game, had once or twice in the early days after his arrival in Middlemarch taken his turn with the queue at the Green Dragon, but afterwards he had no leisure for the game, and no inclination for the socialities there. One evening, however, he had occasion to seek Mr. Bambridge at that resort. The horse dealer had engaged to get him a customer for his remaining good horse, for which Lydgate had determined to substitute a cheap hack, hoping by this reduction of style to get perhaps twenty pounds, and he cared now for every small sum as a help towards feeding the patience of his tradesmen. To run up to the billiard room, as he was passing, would save time. Mr. Bambridge was not yet come, but would be sure to arrive by and by, said his friend Mr. Horrock, and Lydgate stayed, playing a game for the sake of passing the time. That evening he had the peculiar light in the eyes and the unusual vivacity which had been once noticed in him by Mr. Fairbrother. The exceptional fact of his presence was much noticed in the room, where there was a good deal of Middlemarch company, and several lookers-on, as well as some of the players, were betting with animation. Lydgate was playing well, and felt confident, the bets were dropping round him, and with a swift glancing thought of the probable gain which might double the sum he was saving from his horse, he began to bet on his own play, and won again and again. Mr. Bambridge had come in, but Lydgate did not notice him. He was not only excited with his play, but visions were gleaming on him of going the next day to Brassing, where there was gambling on a grander scale to be had, and where, by one powerful snatch at the devil's bait, he might carry it off without the hook, and by his rescue from his daily solicitings. He was still winning when two new visitors entered. One of them was a young Holly, just come from his law studies in town, and the other was Fred Vincey, who had spent several evenings of late at this old haunt of his. Young Holly, an accomplished billiard player, brought a cool fresh hand to the cue. But Fred Vincey, startled at seeing Lydgate, and astonished to see him betting with an excited air, stood aside, and kept out of the circle round the table. Fred had been rewarding resolution by a little laxity of late. He had been working heartily for six months at all outdoor occupations under Mr. Garth, and by dint of severe practice had nearly mastered the defects of his handwriting, this practice being, perhaps, a little the less severe that it was often carried on in the evening at Mr. Garth's under the eyes of Mary. But the last fortnight Mary had been staying at Lowick Parsonage with the ladies there, during Mr. Fairbrother's residence in Middlemarch, where he was carrying out some parochial plans, and Fred, 
not seeing anything more agreeable to do, had turned into the green dragon, partly to play at billiards, partly to taste the old flavor of discourse about horses, sport, and things in general, considered from a point of view which was not strenuously correct. He had not been out hunting once this season, had had no horse of his own to ride, and had gone from place to place chiefly with Mr. Garth in his gig, or on the sober cob which Mr. Garth could lend him. It was a little too bad, Fred began to think, that he should be kept in the traces with more severity than if he had been a clergyman. I will tell you what, Mistress Mary, it will be rather harder work to learn surveying and drawing plans than it would have been to write sermons, he had said, wishing her to appreciate what he went through for her sake, and as to Hercules and Theseus, they were nothing to me. They had sport, and never learned to write a bookkeeping hand. And now, Mary being out of the way for a little while, Fred, like any other strong dog who cannot slip his collar, had pulled up the staple of his chain and made a small escape, not of course meaning to go fast or far. There could be no reason why he should not play at billiards, but he was determined not to bet. As to money just now, Fred had in his mind the heroic project of saving almost all of the eighty pounds that Mr. Garth offered him, and returning it, which he could easily do by giving up all feudal money spending, since he had a superfluous stock of clothes, and no expense in his board. In that way he could, in one year, go a good way towards repaying the ninety pounds of which he had deprived Mrs. Garth, unhappily at a time when she needed that some more than she did now. Nevertheless, it must be acknowledged that on this evening, which was the fifth of his recent visits to the billiard room, Fred had, not in his pocket, but in his mind, the ten pounds which he meant to reserve for himself from his half-year's salary, having before him the pleasure of carrying thirty to Mrs. Garth when Mary was likely to be come home again, he had those ten pounds in his mind as a fund from which he might risk something, if there were a chance of a good bet. Why? Well, when sovereigns were flying about, why shouldn't he catch a few? He would never go far along that road again, but a man likes to assure himself, and men of pleasure generally, what he could do in the way of mischief if he chose, and that if he abstains from making himself ill, or beggaring himself, or talking with the utmost looseness which the narrow limits of human capacity will allow, it is not because he is a spoony. Fred did not enter into formal reasons, which are a very artificial, inexact way of representing the tingling returns of old habit, and the caprices of young blood, but there was lurking in him a prophetic sense that evening, that when he began to play he should also begin to bet, that he should enjoy some punch drinking, and in general prepare himself for feeling, rather seedy, in the morning. It is in such indefinable movements that action often begins. But the last thing likely to have entered Fred's expectation was that he should see his brother-in-law Lydgate, of whom he had never quite dropped the old opinion that he was a prig, and tremendously conscious of his superiority, looking excited and betting, just as he himself might have done. Fred felt a shock greater than he could quite account for by the vague knowledge that Lydgate was in debt, and that his father had refused to help him, and his own inclination to enter into the play was suddenly checked. It was a strange reversal of attitudes, Fred's blond face and blue eyes, usually bright and careless, ready to give attention to anything that held out a promise of amusement, looking involuntarily grave and almost embarrassed as if by the sight of something unfitting, while Lydgate, who had habitually an air of self-possessed strength, and a certain meditativeness that seemed to lie behind his most observant attention, was acting, watching, speaking with that excited narrow consciousness which reminds one of an animal with fierce eyes and retractile claws. Lydgate, by betting on his own strokes, had won sixteen pounds, but young Hawley's arrival had changed the poise of things. He made first-rate strokes himself, and began to bet against Lydgate strokes, the strain of whose nerves was thus changed from simple confidence in his own movements to defying another person's doubt in them. The defiance was more exciting than the confidence, but it was less sure. He continued to bet on his own play, but began often to fail. Still he went on, for his mind was as utterly narrowed into that precipitous crevice of play as if he had been the most ignorant lounger there. Fred observed that Lydgate was losing fast, and found himself in the new situation of puzzling his brains to think of some device by which, without being offensive, 
he could withdraw Lydgate's attention and perhaps suggest to him a reason for quitting the room. He saw that others were observing Lydgate's strange unlikeness to himself, and it occurred to him that merely to touch his elbow and call him aside for a moment might rouse him from his absorption. He could think of nothing cleverer than the daring improbability of saying that he wanted to see Rosie and wished to know if she were at home this evening, and he was going desperately to carry out this weak device, when a waiter came up to him with a message, saying that Mr. Fairbrother was below, and begged to speak with him. Fred was surprised, not quite comfortably, but sending word that he would be down immediately, he went with a new impulse up to Lydgate, said, can I speak to you a moment, and drew him aside. Fairbrother has just sent up a message to say that he wants to speak to me. He is below. I thought you might like to know he was there, if you had anything to say to him. Fred had simply snatched up this pretext for speaking, because he could not say, you are losing confoundedly, and are making everybody stare at you, you had better come away. But inspiration could hardly have served him better. Lydgate had not before seen that Fred was present, and his sudden appearance with an announcement of Mr. Fairbrother had the effect of a sharp concussion. No, no, said Lydgate, I have nothing particular to say to him. But, the game is up, I must be going, I came in just to see Bambridge. Bambridge is over there, but he is making a row, I don't think he's ready for business. Come down with me to fair brother. I expect he is going to blow me up, and you will shield me, said Fred, with some adroitness. Lydgate felt shame, but could not bear to act as if he felt it, by refusing to see Mr. Fairbrother, and he went down. They merely shook hands, however, and spoke of the frost, and when all three had turned into the street, the vicar seemed quite willing to say goodbye to Lydgate. His present purpose was clearly to talk with Fred alone, and he said, Kindly, I disturbed you, young gentleman, because I have some pressing business with you. Walk with me to St. Botolph's, will you? It was a fine night, the sky thick with stars, and Mr. Fairbrother proposed that they should make a circuit to the old church by the London Road. The next thing he said was, I thought Lydgate never went to the Green Dragon? So did I, said Fred. But he said that he went to see Bambridge. He was not playing, then? Fred had not meant to tell this, but he was obliged now to say, yes, he was. But I suppose it was an accidental thing. I have never seen him there before. You have been going often yourself, then, lately? Oh, about five or six times. I think you had some good reason for giving up the habit of going there. Yes. You know all about it, said Fred, not liking to be catechized in this way. I made a clean breast to you. I suppose that gives me a warrant to speak about the matter now. It is understood between us, is it not, that we are on a footing of open friendship, I have listened to you, and you will be willing to listen to me. I may take my turn in talking a little about myself? I am under the deepest obligation to you, Mr. Fairbrother, said Fred, in a state of uncomfortable surmise. I will not affect to deny that you are under some obligation to me. But I am going to confess to you, Fred, that I have been tempted to reverse all that by keeping silence with you just now. When somebody said to me, young Vincy has taken to being at the billiard table every night again, he won't bear the curb long, I was tempted to do the opposite of what I am doing, to hold my tongue and wait while you went down the ladder again, betting first and then, I have not made any bets, said Fred, hastily. Glad to hear it. But I say, my prompting was to look on and see you take the wrong turning, wear out Garth's patience, and lose the best opportunity of your life, the opportunity which you made some rather difficult effort to secure. You can guess the feeling which raised that temptation in me, I am sure you know it. I am sure you know that the satisfaction of your affection stands in the way of mine. There was a pause. Mr. Fairbrother seemed to wait for a recognition of the fact, and the emotion perceptible in the tones of his fine voice gave solemnity to his words. But no feeling could quell Fred's alarm. I could not be expected to give her up, he said, after a moment's hesitation, 
it was not a case for any pretense of generosity. Clearly not, when her affection met yours. But relations of this sort, even when they are of long standing, are always liable to change. I can easily conceive that you might act in a way to loosen the tie she feels towards you, it must be remembered that she is only conditionally bound to you, and that in that case, another man, who may flatter himself that he has a hold on her regard, might succeed in winning that firm place in her love as well as respect which you had let slip. I can easily conceive such a result, repeated Mr. Fairbrother, emphatically. There is a companionship of ready sympathy, which might get the advantage even over the longest associations. It seemed to Fred that if Mr. Fairbrother had had a beak and talons instead of his very capable tongue, his mode of attack could hardly be more cruel. He had a horrible conviction that behind all this hypothetic statement there was a knowledge of some actual change in Mary's feeling. Of course I know it might easily be all up with me, he said, in a troubled voice. If she is beginning to compare, he broke off, not liking to betray all he felt, and then said, by the help of a little bitterness, but I thought you were friendly to me. So I am, that is why we are here. But I have had a strong disposition to be otherwise. I have said to myself, if there is a likelihood of that youngster doing himself harm, why should you interfere? Aren't you worth as much as he is, and don't your sixteen years over and above his, in which you have gone rather hungry, give you more right to satisfaction than he has? If there's a chance of his going to the dogs, let him, perhaps you could know how hinder it, and do you take the benefit? There was a pause, in which Fred was seized by a most uncomfortable chill. What was coming next? He dreaded to hear that something had been said to Mary, he felt as if he were listening to a threat rather than a warning. When the vicar began again there was a change in his tone like the encouraging transition to a major key. But I had once meant better than that and I am come back to my old intention. I thought that I could hardly secure myself in it better, Fred, than by telling you just what had gone on in me. And now, do you understand me? I want you to make the happiness of her life and your own, and if there is any chance that a word of warning from me may turn aside any risk to the contrary, well, I have uttered it. There was a drop in the vicar's voice when he spoke the last words. He paused, they were standing on a patch of green where the road diverged toward St. Botolph's, and he put out his hand, as if to imply that the conversation was closed. Fred was moved quite newly. Some one highly susceptible to the contemplation of a fine act has said that it produces a sort of regenerating shudder through the frame and makes one feel ready to begin a new life. A good degree of that effect was just then present in Fred Vinci. I will try to be worthy, he said, breaking off before he could say, of you as well as of her. And meanwhile Mr. Fairbrother had gathered the impulse to say something more. You must not imagine that I believe there is at present any decline in her preference of you, Fred. Set your heart at rest, that if you keep right, other things will keep right. I shall never forget what you have done, Fred answered. I can't say anything that seems worth saying, only I will try that your goodness shall not be thrown away. That's enough. Goodbye, and God bless you. In that way they parted. But both of them walked about a long while before they went out of the starlight. Much of Fred's rumination might be summed up in the words, it certainly would have been a fine thing for her to marry Fairbrother, but if she loves me best and I am a good husband? Perhaps Mr. Fairbrothers might be concentrated into a single shrug and one little speech. To think of the part one little woman can play in the life of a man, so that to renounce her may be a very good imitation of heroism, and to win her may be a discipline. Chapter 67 Now is there civil war within the soul, resolve is thrust from off the sacred throne by clamorous needs, and pride the grand vizier makes humble compact, plays the supple part of envoy and deft-tongued apologist for hungry rebels. Happily Lydgate had ended by losing in the billiard room, and brought away no encouragement to make a raid on luck. On the contrary, he felt unmixed disgust with himself the next day when he had to pay four or five pounds over and above his gains, and he carried about with him a most unpleasant vision of the figure he had made, 
not only rubbing elbows with the men at the Green Dragon but behaving just as they did. A philosopher fallen to betting is hardly distinguishable from a Philistine under the same circumstances, the difference will chiefly be found in his subsequent reflections, and Lydgate chewed a very disagreeable cud in that way. His reason told him how the affair might have been magnified into ruin by a slight change of scenery, if it had been a gambling house that he had turned into, where chance could be clutched with both hands instead of being picked up with thumb and forefinger. Nevertheless, though reason strangled the desire to gamble, there remained the feeling that, with an assurance of luck to the needful amount, he would have liked to gamble, rather than take the alternative which was beginning to urge itself as inevitable. That alternative was to apply to Mr. Bulstrode. Lydgate had so many times boasted both to himself and others that he was totally independent of Bulstrode, to whose plans he had lent himself solely because they enabled him to carry out his own ideas of professional work and public benefit, he had so constantly in their personal intercourse had his pride sustained by the sense that he was making a good social use of this predominating banker, whose opinions he thought contemptible and whose motives often seemed to him an absurd mixture of contradictory impressions, that he had been creating for himself strong ideal obstacles to the proffering of any considerable request to him on his own account. Still, early in March his affairs were at that pass in which men begin to say that their oaths were delivered in ignorance, and to perceive that the act which they had called impossible to them is becoming manifestly possible. With Dover's ugly security soon to be put in force, with the proceeds of his practice immediately absorbed in paying back debts, and with the chance, if the worst were known, of daily supplies being refused on credit, above all with the vision of Rosamond's hopeless discontent continually haunting him, Lydgate had begun to see that he should inevitably bend himself to ask help from somebody or other. At first he had considered whether he should write to Mr. Vincy, but on questioning Rosamond he found that, as he had suspected, she had already applied twice to her father, the last time being since the disappointment from Sir Godwin and Papa had said that Lydgate must look out for himself. Papa said he had come, with one bad year after another, to trade more and more on borrowed capital, and had had to give up many indulgences, he could not spare a single hundred from the charges of his family. He said, let Lydgate ask Bulstrode, they have always been hand and glove. Indeed, Lydgate himself had come to the conclusion that if he must end by asking for a free loan, his relations with Bulstrode, more at least than with any other man, might take the shape of a claim which was not purely personal. Bulstrode had indirectly helped to cause the failure of his practice, and had also been highly gratified by getting a medical partner in his plans, but who among us ever reduced himself to the sort of dependence in which Lydgate now stood, without trying to believe that he had claims which diminished the humiliation of asking? It was true that of late there had seemed to be a new languor of interest in Bulstrode about the hospital, but his health had got worse, and showed signs of a deep-seated nervous affection. In other respects he did not appear to be changed, he had always been highly polite, but Lydgate had observed in him from the first a marked coldness about his marriage and other private circumstances, a coldness which he had hitherto preferred to any warmth of familiarity between them. He deferred the intention from day to day, his habit of acting on his conclusions being made infirm by his repugnance to every possible conclusion and its consequent act. He saw Mr. Bulstrode often, but he did not try to use any occasion for his private purpose. At one moment he thought, I will write a letter, I prefer that to any circuitous talk, at another he thought, no, if I were talking to him, I could make a retreat before any signs of disinclination. Still the days passed and no letter was written, no special interview sought. In his shrinking from the humiliation of a dependent attitude towards Bulstrode, he began to familiarize his imagination with another step even more unlike his remembered self. He began spontaneously to consider whether it would be possible to carry out that puerile notion of Rosamond's which had often made him angry, namely, that they should quit Middlemarch without seeing anything beyond that preface. The question came, would any man buy the practice of me even now, for as little as it is worth? Then the sale might happen as a necessary preparation for going away. But against his taking this step, which he still felt to be a contemptible relinquishment of present work, 
a guilty turning aside from what was a real and might be a widening channel for worthy activity, to start again without any justified destination, there was this obstacle, that the purchaser, if procurable at all, might not be quickly forthcoming. And afterwards? Rosamond in a poor lodging, though in the largest city or most distant town, would not find the life that could save her from gloom, and save him from the reproach of having plunged her into it. For when a man is at the foot of the hill in his fortunes, he may stay along while there in spite of professional accomplishment. In the British climate there is no incompatibility between scientific insight and furnished lodgings, the incompatibility is chiefly between scientific ambition and a wife who objects to that kind of residence. But in the midst of his hesitation, opportunity came to decide him. A note from Mr. Bulstrode requested Lydgate to call on him at the bank. A hypochondriacal tendency had shown itself in the banker's constitution of late, and a lack of sleep, which was really only a slight exaggeration of an habitual dyspeptic symptom, had been dwelt on by him as a sign of threatening insanity. He wanted to consult Lydgate without delay on that particular morning, although he had nothing to tell beyond what he had told before. He listened eagerly to what Lydgate had to say in dissipation of his fears, though this too was only repetition, and this moment in which Bulstrode was receiving a medical opinion with a sense of comfort, seemed to make the communication of a personal need to him easier than it had been in Lydgate's contemplation beforehand. He had been insisting that it would be well for Mr. Bulstrode to relax his attention to business. One sees how any mental strain, however slight, may affect a delicate frame, said Lydgate at that stage of the consultation when the remarks tend to pass from the personal to the general, by the deep stamp which anxiety will make for a time even on the young and vigorous. I am naturally very strong, yet I have been thoroughly shaken lately by an accumulation of trouble. I presume that a constitution in the susceptible state in which mine at present is, would be especially liable to fall a victim to cholera, if it visited our district. And since its appearance near London, we may well besiege the mercy seat for our protection, said Mr. Bulstrode, not intending to evade Lydgate's illusion, but really preoccupied with alarms about himself. You have at all events taken your share in using good practical precautions for the town, and that is the best mode of asking for protection, said Lydgate, with a strong distaste for the broken metaphor and bad logic of the banker's religion, somewhat increased by the apparent deafness of his sympathy. But his mind had taken up its long-prepared movement towards getting help, and was not yet arrested. He added, the town has done well in the way of cleansing, and finding appliances, and I think that if the cholera should come, even our enemies will admit that the arrangements in the hospital are a public good. Truly, said Mr. Bulstrode, with some coldness. With regard to what you say, Mr. Lydgate, about the relaxation of my mental labor, I have for some time been entertaining a purpose to that effect, a purpose of a very decided character. I contemplate at least a temporary withdrawal from the management of much business, whether benevolent or commercial. Also I think of changing my residence for a time, probably I shall close or let the shrubs, and take some place near the coast, under advice of course as to celebrity. That would be a measure which you would recommend? Oh yes, said Lydgate, falling backward in his chair, with ill-repressed impatience under the banker's pale earnest eyes and intense preoccupation with himself. I have for some time felt that I should open this subject with you in relation to our hospital, continued Bulstrode. Under the circumstances I have indicated, of course I must cease to have any personal share in the management, and it is contrary to my views of responsibility to continue a large application of means to an institution which I cannot watch over and to some extent regulate. I shall therefore, in case of my ultimate decision to leave Middlemarch, consider that I withdraw other support to the new hospital than that which will subsist in the fact that I chiefly supplied the expenses of building it, and have contributed further large sums to its successful working. Lydgate's thought, when Bulstrode paused according to his wont, was, he has perhaps been losing a good deal of money. This was the most plausible explanation of a speech which had caused rather a startling change in his expectations. He said in reply, the loss to the hospital can hardly be made up, I fear. Hardly, returned Bulstrode, 
in the same deliberate, silvery tone, except by some changes of plan. The only person who may be certainly counted on as willing to increase her contributions is Mrs. Kasabin. I have had an interview with her on the subject, and I have pointed out to her, as I am about to do to you, that it will be desirable to win a more general support to the new hospital by a change of system. Another pause, but Lydgate did not speak. The change I mean is an amalgamation with the infirmary, so that the new hospital shall be regarded as a special addition to the elder institution, having the same directing board. It will be necessary, also, that the medical management of the two shall be combined. In this way any difficulty as to the adequate maintenance of our new establishment will be removed, the benevolent interests of the town will cease to be divided. Mr. Bulstrode had lowered his eyes from Lydgate's face to the buttons of his coat as he again paused. No doubt that is a good device as to ways and means, said Lydgate, with an edge of irony in his tone. But I can't be expected to rejoice in it at once, since one of the first results will be that the other medical men will upset or interrupt my methods, if it were only because they are mine. I myself, as you know, Mr. Lydgate, highly valued the opportunity of new and independent procedure which you have diligently employed, the original plan, I confess, was one which I had much at heart, under submission to the divine will. But since providential indications demand a renunciation from me, I renounce. Bulstrode showed a rather exasperating ability in this conversation. The broken metaphor and bad logic of motive which had stirred his hearer's contempt were quite consistent with a mode of putting the facts which made it difficult for Lydgate to vent his own indignation and disappointment. After some rapid reflection, he only asked, What did Mrs. Kasabin say? That was the further statement which I wished to make to you, said Bulstrode, who had thoroughly prepared his ministerial explanation. She is, you are aware, a woman of most munificent disposition, and happily in possession, not I presume of great wealth, but of funds which she can well spare. She has informed me that though she has destined the chief part of those funds to another purpose, she is willing to consider whether she cannot fully take my place in relation to the hospital. But she wishes for ample time to mature her thoughts on the subject, and I have told her that there is no need for haste, that, in fact, my own plans are not yet absolute. Lydgate was ready to say, if Mrs. Kasabin would take your place, there would be gain, instead of loss. But there was still a weight on his mind which arrested this cheerful candor. He replied, I suppose, then, that I may enter into the subject with Mrs. Kasabin. Precisely, that is what she expressly desires. Her decision, she says, will much depend on what you can tell her. But not at present, she is, I believe, just setting out on a journey. I have her letter here, said Mr. Bulstrode, drawing it out, and reading from it. I am immediately otherwise engaged, she says. I am going into Yorkshire with Sir James and Lady Chettam, and the conclusions I come to about some land which I am to see there may affect my power of contributing to the hospital. Thus, Mr. Lydgate, there is no haste necessary in this matter, but I wish to apprise you beforehand of what may possibly occur. Mr. Bulstrode returned the letter to his side pocket, and changed his attitude as if his business were closed. Lydgate, whose renewed hope about the hospital only made him more conscious of the facts which poisoned his hope, felt that his effort after help, if made at all, must be made now and vigorously. I am much obliged to you for giving me full notice, he said, with a firm intention in his tone, yet with an interruptedness in his delivery which showed that he spoke unwillingly. The highest object to me is my profession, and I had identified the hospital with the best use I can at present make of my profession. But the best use is not always the same with monetary success. Everything which has made the hospital unpopular has helped with other causes, I think they are all connected with my professional zeal, to make me unpopular as a practitioner. I get chiefly patients who can't pay me. I should like them best, if I had nobody to pay on my own side." Lydgate waited a little, but Bulstrode only bowed, looking at him fixedly, and he went on with the same interrupted enunciation, 
as if he were biting an objectional leak. I have slipped into money difficulties which I can see no way out of, unless someone who trusts me and my future will advance me a sum without other security. I had very little fortune left when I came here. I have no prospects of money from my own family. My expenses, in consequence of my marriage, have been very much greater than I had expected. The result at this moment is that it would take a thousand pounds to clear me. I mean, to free me from the risk of having all my goods sold in security of my largest debt, as well as to pay my other debts, and leave anything to keep us a little beforehand with our small income. I find that it is out of the question that my wife's father should make such an advance. That is why I mention my position to, to the only other man who may be held to have some personal connection with my prosperity or ruin. Lydgate hated to hear himself. But he had spoken now, and had spoken with unmistakable directness. Mr. Bulstrode replied without haste, but also without hesitation. I am grieved, though, I confess, not surprised by this information, Mr. Lydgate. For my own part, I regretted your alliance with my brother-in-law's family, which has always been of prodigal habits, and which has already been much indebted to me for sustainment in its present position. My advice to you, Mr. Lydgate, would be, that instead of involving yourself in further obligations, and continuing a doubtful struggle, you should simply become a bankrupt. That would not improve my prospect, said Lydgate, rising and speaking bitterly, even if it were a more agreeable thing in itself. It is always a trial, said Mr. Bulstrode, but trial, my dear sir, is our portion here, and is a needed corrective. I recommend you to weigh the advice I have given. Thank you, said Lydgate, not quite knowing what he said. I have occupied you too long. Good day. Chapter 68 What suit of grace hath virtue to put on if vice shall wear as good, and do as well? If wrong, if craft, if indiscretion act as fair parts with ends as laudable? Which all this mighty volume of events the world, the universal map of deeds, strongly controls, and proves from all descents, that the directest course still best succeeds. For should not grave and learned experience that looks with the eyes of all the world beside, and with all ages holds intelligence, go safer than deceit without a guide? Daniel, Musophilus. That change of plan and shifting of interest which Bulstrode stated or betrayed in his conversation with Lydgate, had been determined in him by some severe experience which he had gone through since the epoch of Mr. Larcher's sale, when Raffles had recognized Will Ladislaw, and when the banker had in vain attempted an act of restitution which might move divine providence to arrest painful consequences. His certainty that Raffles, unless he were dead, would return to Middlemarch before long, had been justified. On Christmas Eve he had reappeared at the shrubs. Bulstrode was at home to receive him, and hinder his communication with the rest of the family, but he could not altogether hinder the circumstances of the visit from compromising himself and alarming his wife. Raffles proved more unmanageable than he had shown himself to be in his former appearances, his chronic state of mental restlessness, the growing effect of habitual intemperance, quickly shaking off every impression from what was said to him. He insisted on staying in the house, and Bulstrode, weighing two sets of evils, felt that this was at least not a worse alternative than his going into the town. He kept him in his own room for the evening and saw him to bed, Raffles all the while amusing himself with the annoyance he was causing this decent and highly prosperous fellow sinner, an amusement which he facetiously expressed as sympathy with his friend's pleasure in entertaining a man who had been serviceable to him, and who had not had all his earnings. There was a cunning calculation under this noisy joking, a cool resolve to extract something the handsomer from Bulstrode as payment for release from this new application of torture. But his cunning had a little overcast its mark. Bulstrode was indeed more tortured than the coarse fiber of Raffles could enable him to imagine. He had told his wife that he was simply taking care of this wretched creature, the victim of vice, who might otherwise injure himself, he implied, without the direct form of falsehood, that there was a family tie which bound him to this care, and that there were signs of mental alienation in Raffles which urged caution. 
he would himself drive the unfortunate being away the next morning. In these hints he felt that he was supplying Mrs. Bolstrode with precautionary information for his daughters and servants, and accounting for his allowing no one but himself to enter the room even with food and drink. But he sat in an agony of fear lest Raffles should be overheard in his loud and plain references to past facts, lest Mrs. Bolstrode should be even tempted to listen at the door. How could he hinder her, how betray his terror by opening the door to detect her? She was a woman of honest direct habits, and little likely to take so low a course in order to arrive at painful knowledge, but fear was stronger than the calculation of probabilities. In this way Raffles had pushed the torture too far, and produced an effect which had not been in his plan. By showing himself hopelessly unmanageable he had made Bulstrode feel that a strong defiance was the only resource left. After taking Raffles to bed that night the banker ordered his closed carriage to be ready at half-past seven the next morning. At six o'clock he had already been long dressed, and had spent some of his wretchedness in prayer, pleading his motives for averting the worst evil if in anything he had used falsity and spoken what was not true before God. For Bulstrode shrank from a direct lie with an intensity disproportionate to the number of his more indirect misdeeds. But many of these misdeeds were like the subtle muscular movements which are not taken account of in the consciousness, though they bring about the end that we fix our mind on and desire. And it is only what we are vividly conscious of that we can vividly imagine to be seen by omniscience. Bolstrode carried his candle to the bedside of Raffles, who was apparently in a painful dream. He stood silent, hoping that the presence of the light would serve to waken the sleeper gradually and gently, for he feared some noise as the consequence of a too sudden awakening. He had watched for a couple of minutes or more the shudderings and pantings which seemed likely to end in waking, when Raffles, with a long half-stifled moan, started up and stared round him in terror, trembling and gasping. But he made no further noise, and Bulstrode, setting down the candle, awaited his recovery. It was a quarter of an hour later before Bulstrode, with a cold peremptoriness of manner which he had not before shown, said, I came to call you thus early, Mr. Raffles, because I have ordered the carriage to be ready at half-past seven, and intend myself to conduct you as far as Ilsley, where you can either take the railway or await a coach. Raffles was about to speak, but Bulstrode anticipated him imperiously with the words, Be silent, sir, and hear what I have to say. I shall supply you with money now and I will furnish you with a reasonable sum from time to time, on your application to me by letter, but if you choose to present yourself here again, if you return to Middlemarch, if you use your tongue in a manner injurious to me, you will have to live on such fruits as your malice can bring you, without help from me. Nobody will pay you well for blasting my name, I know the worst you can do against me, and I shall brave it if you dare to thrust yourself upon me again. Get up, sir, and do as I order you without noise, or I will send for a policeman to take you off my premises, and you may carry your stories into every pothouse in the town, but you shall have no sixpence from me to pay your expenses there. Bulstrode had rarely in his life spoken with such nervous energy, he had been deliberating on this speech and its probable effects through a large part of the night, and though he did not trust to its ultimately saving him from any return of raffles, he had concluded that it was the best throw he could make. It succeeded in enforcing submission from the jaded man this morning, his empoisoned system at this moment quailed before Bulstrode's cold, resolute bearing, and he was taken off quietly in the carriage before the family breakfast time. The servants imagined him to be a poor relation, and were not surprised that a strict man like their master, who held his head high in the world, should be ashamed of such a cousin and want to get rid of him. The banker's drive of ten miles with his hated companion was a dreary beginning of the Christmas day, but at the end of the drive, Raffles had recovered his spirits, and parted in a contentment for which there was the good reason that the banker had given him a hundred pounds. Various motives urged Bulstrode to this open-handedness, but he did not himself inquire closely into all of them. As he had stood watching Raffles in his uneasy sleep, it had certainly entered his mind that the man had been much shattered since the first gift of two hundred pounds. He had taken care to repeat the incisive statement of his resolve not to be played on any more, 
and had tried to penetrate Raffles with the fact that he had shown the risks of bribing him to be quite equal to the risks of defying him. But when, freed from his repulsive presence, Bulstrode returned to his quiet home, he brought with him no confidence that he had secured more than a respite. It was as if he had had a loathsome dream, and could not shake off its images with their hateful kindred of sensations, as if on all the pleasant surroundings of his life a dangerous reptile had left his slimy traces. Who can know how much of his most inward life is made up of the thoughts he believes other men to have about him, until that fabric of opinion is threatened with ruin? Bulstrode was only the more conscious that there was a deposit of uneasy presentiment in his wife's mind, because she carefully avoided any allusion to it. He had been used every day to taste the flavor of supremacy and the tribute of complete deference, and the certainty that he was watched or measured with a hidden suspicion of his having some discreditable secret, made his voice totter when he was speaking to edification. Foreseeing, to men of Bulstrode's anxious temperament, is often worse than seeing, and his imagination continually heightened the anguish of an imminent disgrace. Yes, imminent, for if his defiance of Raffles did not keep the man away, and though he prayed for this result he hardly hoped for it, the disgrace was certain. In vain he said to himself that, if permitted, it would be a divine visitation, a chastisement, a preparation, he recoiled from the imagined burning, and he judged that it must be more for the divine glory that he should escape dishonor. That recoil had at last urged him to make preparations for quitting Middlemarch. If evil truth must be reported of him, he would then be at a less scorching distance from the contempt of his old neighbors, and in a new scene, where his life would not have gathered the same wide sensibility, the tormentor, if he pursued him, would be less formidable. To leave the place finally would, he knew, be extremely painful to his wife, and on other grounds he would have preferred to stay where he had struck root. Hence he made his preparations at first in a conditional way, wishing to leave on all sides an opening for his return after brief absence, if any favorable intervention of providence should dissipate his fears. He was preparing to transfer his management of the bank, and to give up any active control of other commercial affairs in the neighborhood, on the ground of his failing health, but without excluding his future resumption of such work. The measure would cause him some added expense and some diminution of income beyond what he had already undergone from the general depression of trade, and the hospital presented itself as a principal object of outlay on which he could fairly economize. This was the experience which had determined his conversation with Lydgate. But at this time his arrangements had most of them gone no farther than a stage at which he could recall them if they proved to be unnecessary. He continually deferred the final steps, in the midst of his fears, like many a man who is in danger of shipwreck or of being dashed from his carriage by runaway horses, he had a clinging impression that something would happen to hinder the worst, and that to spoil his life by a late transplantation might be over hasty, especially since it was difficult to account satisfactorily to his wife for the project of their indefinite exile from the only place where she would like to live. Among the affairs Bulstrode had to care for, was the management of the farm at Stone Court in case of his absence, and on this as well as on all other matters connected with any houses and land he possessed in or about Middlemarch, he had consulted Caleb Garth. Like everyone else who had business of that sort, he wanted to get the agent who was more anxious for his employer's interests than his own. With regard to Stone Court, since Bulstrode wished to retain his hold on the stock, and to have an arrangement by which he himself could, if he chose, resume his favorite recreation of superintendence, Caleb had advised him not to trust to a mere bailiff, but to let the land, stock, and implements yearly, and take a proportionate share of the proceeds. May I trust to you to find me a tenant on these terms, Mr. Garth, said Bulstrode. And will you mention to me the yearly sum which would repay you for managing these affairs which we have discussed together? I'll think about it, said Caleb, in his blunt way. I'll see how I can make it out. If it had not been that he had to consider Fred Vincy's future, Mr. Garth would not probably have been glad of any addition to his work, of which his wife was always fearing an excess for him as he grew older. But on quitting Bulstrode after that conversation, a very alluring idea occurred to him about this said letting of Stone Court. 
What if Bulstrode would agree to his placing Fred Vinci there on the understanding that he, Caleb Garth, should be responsible for the management? It would be an excellent schooling for Fred, he might make a modest income there, and still have time left to get knowledge by helping in other business. He mentioned his notion to Mrs. Garth with such evident delight that she could not bear to chill his pleasure by expressing her constant fear of his undertaking too much. The lad would be as happy as two, he said, throwing himself back in his chair, and looking radiant, if I could tell him it was all settled. Think, Susan. His mind had been running on that place for years before old Featherstone died. And it would be as pretty a turn of things as could be that he should hold the place in a good industrious way after all by his taking to business. For it's likely enough Bulstrode might let him go on, and gradually by the stock. He hasn't made up his mind, I can see, whether or not he shall settle somewhere else as a lasting thing. I never was better pleased with a notion in my life. And then the children might be married by and by, Susan. You will not give any hint of the plan to Fred, until you are sure that Bulstrode would agree to the plan, said Mrs. Garth, in a tone of gentle caution. And as to marriage, Caleb, we old people need not help to hasten it. Oh, I don't know, said Caleb, swinging his head aside. Marriage is a taming thing. Fred would want less of my bit and bridle. However, I shall say nothing till I know the ground I'm treading on. I shall speak to Bulstrode again. He took his earliest opportunity of doing so. Bulstrode had anything but a warm interest in his nephew Fred Vinci, but he had a strong wish to secure Mr. Garth's services on many scattered points of business at which he was sure to be a considerable loser, if they were under less conscientious management. On that ground he made no objection to Mr. Garth's proposal, and there was also another reason why he was not sorry to give a consent which was to benefit one of the Vinci family. It was that Mrs. Bulstrode, having heard of Lydgate's debts, had been anxious to know whether her husband could not do something for poor Rosamond, and had been much troubled on learning from him that Lydgate's affairs were not easily remediable, and that the wisest plan was to let them take their course. Mrs. Bulstrode had then said for the first time, I think you are always a little hard towards my family, Nicholas. And I am sure I have no reason to deny any of my relatives. Too worldly they may be, but no one ever had to say that they were not respectable. My dear Harriet, said Mr. Bulstrode, wincing under his wife's eyes, which were filling with tears, I have supplied your brother with a great deal of capital. I cannot be expected to take care of his married children. That seemed to be true, and Mrs. Bulstrode's remonstrance subsided into pity for poor Rosamond, whose extravagant education she had always foreseen the fruits of. But remembering that dialogue, Mr. Bulstrode felt that when he had to talk to his wife fully about his plan of quitting Middlemarch, he should be glad to tell her that he had made an arrangement which might be for the good of her nephew Fred. At present he had merely mentioned to her that he thought of shutting up the shrubs for a few months and taking a house on the southern coast. Hence Mr. Garth got the assurance he desired, namely, that in case of Bulstrode's departure from Middlemarch for an indefinite time, Fred Vincey should be allowed to have the tenancy of Stone Court on the terms proposed. Caleb was so elated with his hope of this neat turn being given to things, that if his self-control had not been braced by a little affectionate wifely scolding, he would have betrayed everything to Mary, wanting to give the child comfort. However, he restrained himself, and kept in strict privacy from Fred's certain visits which he was making to Stone Court, in order to look more thoroughly into the state of the land and stock, and take a preliminary estimate. He was certainly more eager in these visits than the probable speed of events required him to be, but he was stimulated by a fatherly delight in occupying his mind with this bit of probable happiness which he held in store like a hidden birthday gift for Fred and Mary. But suppose the whole scheme should turn out to be a castle in the air, said Mrs. Garth. Well, well, replied Caleb, the castle will tumble about nobody's head. Chapter 69 If thou hast heard a word, let it die with thee. Ecclesiasticus
Mr. Bulstrode was still seated in his manager's room at the bank, about three o'clock of the same day on which he had received Lydgate there, when the clerk entered to say that his horse was waiting, and also that Mr. Garth was outside and begged to speak with him. By all means, said Bulstrode, and Caleb entered. Pray sit down, Mr. Garth, continued the banker, in his suavest tone. I am glad that you arrived just in time to find me here. I know you count your minutes. Oh, said Caleb, gently, with a slow swing of his head on one side, as he seated himself and laid his hat on the floor. He looked at the ground, leaning forward and letting his long fingers droop between his legs, while each finger moved in succession, as if it were sharing some thought which filled his large quiet brow. Mr. Bulstrode, like everyone else who knew Caleb, was used to his slowness in beginning to speak on any topic which he felt to be important, and rather expected that he was about to recur to the buying of some houses in blind men's court, for the sake of pulling them down, as a sacrifice of property which would be well repaid by the influx of air and light on that spot. It was by propositions of this kind that Caleb was sometimes troublesome to his employers, but he had usually found Bulstrode ready to meet him in projects of improvement, and they had got on well together. When he spoke again, however, it was to say, in rather a subdued voice, I have just come away from Stone Court, Mr. Bulstrode. You found nothing wrong there, I hope, said the banker, I was there myself yesterday. Abel has done well with the lambs this year. Why, yes, said Caleb, looking up gravely, there is something wrong, a stranger, who is very ill, I think. He wants a doctor, and I came to tell you of that. His name is Raffles. He saw the shock of his words passing through Bulstrode's frame. On this subject the banker had thought that his fears were too constantly on the watch to be taken by surprise, but he had been mistaken. Poor wretch, he said in a compassionate tone, though his lips trembled a little. Do you know how he came there? I took him myself, said Caleb, quietly, took him up in my gig. He had got down from the coach, and was walking a little beyond the turning from the toll house, and I overtook him. He remembered seeing me with you once before, at Stone Court, and he asked me to take him on. I saw he was ill, it seemed to me the right thing to do, to carry him under shelter. And now I think you should lose no time in getting advice for him. Caleb took up his hat from the floor as he ended, and rose slowly from his seat. Certainly, said Bulstrode, whose mind was very active at this moment. Perhaps you will yourself oblige me, Mr. Garth, by calling at Mr. Lydgate's as you pass, or stay. He may at this hour probably be at the hospital. I will first send my man on the horse there with a note this instant, and then I will myself ride to Stone Court. Bulstrode quickly wrote a note and went out himself to give the commission to his man. When he returned, Caleb was standing as before with one hand on the back of the chair, holding his hat with the other. In Bulstrode's mind the dominant thought was, perhaps Raffles only spoke to Garth of his illness. Garth may wonder, as he must have done before, at this disreputable fellow's claiming intimacy with me, but he will know nothing. And he is friendly to me, I can be of use to him. He longed for some confirmation of this hopeful conjecture, but to have asked any question as to what Raffles had said or done would have been to betray fear. I am exceedingly obliged to you, Mr. Garth, he said, in his usual tone of politeness. My servant will be back in a few minutes, and I shall then go myself to see what can be done for this unfortunate man. Perhaps you had some other business with me? If so, pray be seated. Thank you said Caleb, making a slight gesture with his right hand to wave the invitation. I wish to say, Mr. Bulstrode, that I must request you to put your business into some other hands than mine. I am obliged to you for your handsome way of meeting me, about the letting of Stone Court, and all other business. But I must give it up. A sharp certainty entered like a stab into Bulstrode's soul. This is sudden, Mr. Garth, was all he could say at first. It is, said Caleb, but it is quite fixed. I must give it up. He spoke with a firmness which was very gentle, 
and yet he could see that Bulstrode seemed to cower under that gentleness, his face looking dried and his eyes swerving away from the glance which rested on him. Caleb felt a deep pity for him, but he could have used no pretexts to account for his resolve, even if they would have been of any use. You have been led to this, I apprehend, by some slanders concerning me uttered by that unhappy creature, said Bulstrode, anxious now to know the utmost. That is true. I can't deny that I act upon what I heard from him. You are a conscientious man, Mr. Garth, a man, I trust, who feels himself accountable to God. You would not wish to injure me by being too ready to believe a slander, said Bulstrode, casting about for pleas that might be adapted to his hearer's mind. That is a poor reason for giving up a connection which I think I may say will be mutually beneficial. I would injure no man if I could help it, said Caleb, even if I thought God winked at it. I hope I should have a feeling for my fellow creature. But, sir, I am obliged to believe that this Raffles has told me the truth. And I can't be happy in working with you, or profiting by you. It hurts my mind. I must beg you to seek another agent. Very well, Mr. Garth. But I must at least claim to know the worst that he has told you. I must know what is the foul speech that I am liable to be the victim of, said Bulstrode, a certain amount of anger beginning to mingle with his humiliation before this quiet man who renounced his benefits. That's needless, said Caleb, waving his hand, bowing his head slightly, and not swerving from the tone which had in it the merciful intention to spare this pitiable man. What he has said to me will never pass from my lips, unless something now unknown forces it from me. If you led a harmful life for gain, and kept others out of their rights by deceit, to get the more for yourself, I dare say you repent, you would like to go back, and can't, that must be a bitter thing, Caleb paused a moment and shook his head, it is not for me to make your life harder to you. But you do, you do make it harder to me, said Bulstrode constrained into a genuine, pleading cry. You make it harder to me by turning your back on me. That I'm forced to do, said Caleb, still more gently, lifting up his hand. I am sorry. I don't judge you and say, he is wicked, and I am righteous. God forbid. I don't know everything. A man may do wrong, and his will may rise clear out of it, though he can't get his life clear. That's a bad punishment. If it is so with you, well, I'm very sorry for you. But I have that feeling inside me, that I can't go on working with you. That's all, Mr. Bulstrode. Everything else is buried, so far as my will goes. And I wish you good day. One moment, Mr. Garth, said Bulstrode, hurriedly. I may trust then to your solemn assurance that you will not repeat either to man or woman what, even if it have any degree of truth in it, is yet a malicious representation. Caleb's wrath was stirred, and he said, indignantly, why should I have said it if I didn't mean it? I am in no fear of you. Such tales as that will never tempt my tongue. Excuse me, I am agitated, I am the victim of this abandoned man. Stop a bit. You have got to consider whether you didn't help to make him worse, when you profited by his vices. You are wronging me by too readily believing him, said Bulstrode, oppressed, as by a nightmare, with the inability to deny flatly what Raffles might have said, and yet feeling it an escape that Caleb had not so stated it to him as to ask for that flat denial. No, said Caleb, lifting his hand deprecatingly, I am ready to believe better, when better is proved. I rob you of no good chance. As to speaking, I hold it a crime to expose a man's sin unless I'm clear it must be done to save the innocent. That is my way of thinking, Mr. Bulstrode, and what I say, I've no need to swear. I wish you good day. Some hours later, when he was at home, Caleb said to his wife, incidentally, that he had had some little differences with Bulstrode, and that in consequence, he had given up all notion of taking Stone Court, and indeed had resigned doing further business for him. He was disposed to interfere too much, was he, said Mrs. Garth, imagining that her husband had been touched on his sensitive point, 
and not been allowed to do what he thought right as to materials and modes of work. Oh, said Caleb, bowing his head and waving his hand gravely. And Mrs. Garth knew that this was a sign of his not intending to speak further on the subject. As for Bulstrode, he had almost immediately mounted his horse and set off for Stone Court, being anxious to arrive there before Lydgate. His mind was crowded with images and conjectures, which were a language to his hopes and fears, just as we hear tones from the vibrations which shake our whole system. The deep humiliation with which he had winced under Caleb Garth's knowledge of his past and rejection of his patronage, alternated with and almost gave way to the sense of safety in the fact that Garth, and no other, had been the man to whom Raffles had spoken. It seemed to him a sort of earnest that Providence intended his rescue from worse consequences, the way being thus left open for the hope of secrecy. That Raffles should be afflicted with illness, that he should have been led to Stone Court rather than elsewhere, Bulstrode's heart fluttered at the vision of probabilities which these events conjured up. If it should turn out that he was freed from all danger of disgrace, if he could breathe in perfect liberty, his life should be more consecrated than it had ever been before. He mentally lifted up this vow as if it would urge the result he longed for, he tried to believe in the potency of that prayerful resolution, its potency to determine death. He knew that he ought to say, Thy will be done, and he said it often. But the intense desire remained that the will of God might be the death of that hated man. Yet when he arrived at Stone Court he could not see the change in Raffles without a shock. But for his pallor and feebleness, Bulstrode would have called the change in him entirely mental. Instead of his loud tormenting mood, he showed an intense, vague terror, and seemed to deprecate Bulstrode's anger, because the money was all gone, he had been robbed, it had half of it been taken from him. He had only come here because he was ill and somebody was hunting him, somebody was after him, he had told nobody anything, he had kept his mouth shut. Bulstrode, not knowing the significance of these symptoms, interpreted this new nervous susceptibility into a means of alarming Raffles into true confessions, and taxed him with falsehood in saying that he had not told anything, since he had just told the man who took him up in his gig and brought him to Stone Court. Raffles denied this with solemn adjurations, the fact being that the links of consciousness were interrupted in him, and that his minute terror-stricken narrative to Caleb Garth had been delivered under a set of visionary impulses which had dropped back into darkness. Bulstrode's heart sank again at this sign that he could get no grasp over the wretched man's mind, and that no word of Raffles could be trusted as to the fact which he most wanted to know, namely, whether or not he had really kept silence to everyone in the neighborhood except Caleb Garth. The housekeeper had told him without the least constraint of manner that since Mr. Garth left, Raffles had asked her for beer, and after that had not spoken, seeming very ill. On that side it might be concluded that there had been no betrayal. Mrs. Abel thought, like the servants at the shrubs, that the strange man belonged to the unpleasant kin who are among the troubles of the rich, she had at first referred the kinship to Mr. Rigg, and where there was property left, the buzzing presence of such large bluebottles seemed natural enough. How he could be kin to Bulstrode as well was not so clear, but Mrs. Abel agreed with her husband that there was no knowing, a proposition which had a great deal of mental food for her, so that she shook her head over it without further speculation. In less than an hour Lydgate arrived. Bulstrode met him outside the wainscoted parlor, where Raffles was, and said, I have called you in, Mr. Lydgate, to an unfortunate man who was once in my employment, many years ago. Afterwards he went to America, and returned I fear to an idle dissolute life. Being destitute, he has a claim on me. He was slightly connected with Rig, the former owner of this place, and in consequence found his way here. I believe he is seriously ill, apparently his mind is affected. I feel bound to do the utmost for him. Lydgate, who had the remembrance of his last conversation with Bulstrode strongly upon him, was not disposed to say an unnecessary word to him, and bowed slightly in answer to this account, but just before entering the room he turned automatically and said, What is his name? 
to no names being as much a part of the medical man's accomplishment as of the practical politicians. Raffles, John Raffles, said Bulstrode, who hoped that whatever became of Raffles, Lydgate would never know any more of him. When he had thoroughly examined and considered the patient, Lydgate ordered that he should go to bed, and be kept there in as complete quiet as possible, and then went with Bulstrode into another room. It is a serious case, I apprehend, said the banker, before Lydgate began to speak. No, and yes, said Lydgate, half dubiously. It is difficult to decide as to the possible effect of long-standing complications, but the man had a robust constitution to begin with. I should not expect this attack to be fatal, though of course the system is in a ticklish state. He should be well watched and attended to. I will remain here myself, said Bulstrode. Mrs. Abel and her husband are inexperienced. I can easily remain here for the night, if you will oblige me by taking a note for Mrs. Bulstrode. I should think that is hardly necessary, said Lydgate. He seems tame and terrified enough. He might become more unmanageable. But there is a man here, is there not? I have more than once stayed here a few nights for the sake of seclusion, said Bulstrode, indifferently, I am quite disposed to do so now. Mrs. Abel and her husband can relieve or aid me, if necessary. Very well. Then I need give my directions only to you, said Lydgate, not feeling surprised at a little peculiarity in Bulstrode. You think, then, that the case is hopeful, said Bulstrode, when Lydgate had ended giving his orders. Unless there turn out to be further complications, such as I have not at present detected, yes, said Lydgate. He may pass on to a worse stage, but I should not wonder if he got better in a few days, by adhering to the treatment I have prescribed. There must be firmness. Remember, if he calls for liquors of any sort, not to give them to him. In my opinion, men in his condition are oftener killed by treatment than by the disease. Still, new symptoms may arise. I shall come again tomorrow morning. After waiting for the note to be carried to Mrs. Bulstrode, Lydgate rode away, forming no conjectures, in the first instance, about the history of Raffles, but rehearsing the whole argument, which had lately been much stirred by the publication of Dr. Ware's abundant experience in America, as to the right way of treating cases of alcoholic poisoning such as this. Lydgate, when abroad, had already been interested in this question, he was strongly convinced against the prevalent practice of allowing alcohol and persistently administering large doses of opium, and he had repeatedly acted on this conviction with a favorable result. The man is in a diseased state, he thought, but there's a good deal of wear in him still. I suppose he is an object of charity to Bulstrode. It is curious what patches of hardness and tenderness lie side by side in men's dispositions. Bulstrode seems the most unsympathetic fellow I ever saw about some people, and yet he has taken no end of trouble, and spent a great deal of money, on benevolent objects. I suppose he has some test by which he finds out whom heaven cares for, he has made up his mind that it doesn't care for me. This streak of bitterness came from a plenteous source, and kept widening in the current of his thought as he neared Lowick Gate. He had not been there since his first interview with Bulstrode in the morning, having been found at the hospital by the banker's messenger, and for the first time he was returning to his home without the vision of any expedient in the background which left him a hope of raising money enough to deliver him from the coming destitution of everything which made his married life tolerable. Everything which saved him and Rosamond from that bare isolation in which they would be forced to recognize how little of a comfort they could be to each other. It was more bearable to do without tenderness for himself than to see that his own tenderness could make no amends for the lack of other things to her. The sufferings of his own pride from humiliations past and to come were keen enough, yet they were hardly distinguishable to himself from that more acute pain which dominated them the pain of foreseeing that Rosamond would come to regard him chiefly as the cause of disappointment and unhappiness to her. He had never liked the makeshifts of poverty, and they had never before entered into his prospects for himself, but he was beginning now to imagine how two creatures who loved each other, 
and had a stock of thoughts in common, might laugh over their shabby furniture, and their calculations how far they could afford butter and eggs. But the glimpse of that poetry seemed as far off from him as the carelessness of the golden age, in poor Rosamond's mind there was not room enough for luxuries to look small in. He got down from his horse in a very sad mood, and went into the house, not expecting to be cheered except by his dinner, and reflecting that before the evening closed it would be wise to tell Rosamond of his application to Bulstrode and its failure. It would be well not to lose time in preparing her for the worst. But his dinner waited long for him before he was able to eat it. For on entering he found that Dover's agent had already put a man in the house, and when he asked where Mrs. Lydgate was, he was told that she was in her bedroom. He went up and found her stretched on the bed pale and silent, without an answer even in her face to any word or look of his. He sat down by the bed and leaning over her said with almost a cry of prayer, Forgive me for this misery, my poor Rosamond. Let us only love one another. She looked at him silently, still with the blank despair on her face, but then the tears began to fill her blue eyes, and her lip trembled. The strong man had had too much to bear that day. He let his head fall beside hers and sobbed. He did not hinder her from going to her father early in the morning, it seemed now that he ought not to hinder her from doing as she pleased. In half an hour she came back, and said that Papa and Mama wished her to go and stay with them while things were in this miserable state. Papa said he could do nothing about the debt, if he paid this, there would be half a dozen more. She had better come back home again till Lydgate had got a comfortable home for her. Do you object, Tertius? Do as you like, said Lydgate. But things are not coming to a crisis immediately. There is no hurry. I should not go till tomorrow, said Rosamond, I shall want to pack my clothes. Oh, I would wait a little longer than tomorrow, there is no knowing what may happen, said Lydgate, with bitter irony. I may get my neck broken, and that may make things easier to you. It was Lydgate's misfortune and Rosamond's too, that his tenderness towards her, which was both an emotional prompting and a well-considered resolve, was inevitably interrupted by these outbursts of indignation either ironical or remonstrant. She thought them totally unwarranted, and the repulsion which this exceptional severity excited in her was in danger of making the more persistent tenderness unacceptable. I see you do not wish me to go, she said, with chill mildness, why can you not say so, without that kind of violence? I shall stay until you request me to do otherwise. Lydgate said no more, but went out on his rounds. He felt bruised and shattered, and there was a dark line under his eyes which Rosamond had not seen before. She could not bear to look at him. Tertius had a way of taking things which made them a great deal worse for her. Chapter 70 Our deeds still travel with us from afar, and what we have been makes us what we are. Bulstrode's first object after Lydgate had left Stone Court was to examine Raffles' pockets, which he imagined were sure to carry signs in the shape of hotel bills of the places he had stopped in, if he had not told the truth in saying that he had come straight from Liverpool because he was ill and had no money. There were various bills crammed into his pocketbook, but none of a later date than Christmas at any other place, except one, which bore date that morning. This was crumpled up with a handbill about a horse fare in one of his tail pockets, and represented the cost of three days' stay at an inn at Bilkley, where the fair was held, a town at least forty miles from Middlemarch. The bill was heavy, and since Raffles had no luggage with him, it seemed probable that he had left his portmanteau behind in payment, in order to save money for his travelling fare, for his purse was empty, and he had only a couple of sixpences and some loose pence in his pockets. Bulstrode gathered a sense of safety from these indications that Raffles had really kept at a distance from Middlemarch since his memorable visit at Christmas. At a distance and among people who were strangers to Bulstrode, what satisfaction could there be to Raffles' tormenting, self-magnifying vein in telling old scandalous stories about a Middlemarch banker? And what harm if he did talk? The chief point now was to keep watch over him as long as there was any danger of that intelligible raving, that unaccountable impulse to tell, 
which seemed to have acted towards Caleb Garth, and Bulstrode felt much anxiety lest some such impulse should come over him at the sight of Lydgate. He sat up alone with him through the night, only ordering the housekeeper to lie down in her clothes, so as to be ready when he called her, alleging his own indisposition to sleep, and his anxiety to carry out the doctor's orders. He did carry them out faithfully, although Raffles was incessantly asking for brandy, and declaring that he was sinking away, that the earth was sinking away from under him. He was restless and sleepless, but still quailing and manageable. On the offer of the food ordered by Lydgate, which he refused, and the denial of other things which he demanded, he seemed to concentrate all his terror on Bulstrode, imploringly deprecating his anger, his revenge on him by starvation, and declaring with strong oaths that he had never told any mortal a word against him. Even this Bulstrode felt that he would not have liked Lydgate to hear, but a more alarming sign of fitful alternation in his delirium was, that in the morning twilight Raffles suddenly seemed to imagine a doctor present, addressing him and declaring that Bulstrode wanted to starve him to death out of revenge for telling, when he never had told. Bulstrode's native imperiousness and strength of determination served him well. This delicate-looking man, himself nervously perturbed, found the needed stimulus in his strenuous circumstances, and through that difficult night and morning, while he had the air of an animated corpse returned to movement without warmth, holding the mastery by its chill impassibility, his mind was intensely at work thinking of what he had to guard against and what would win him security. Whatever prayers he might lift up, whatever statements he might inwardly make of this man's wretched spiritual condition, and the duty he himself was under to submit to the punishment divinely appointed for him rather than to wish for evil to another, through all this effort to condense words into a solid mental state, there pierced and spread with irresistible vividness the images of the events he desired. And in the train of those images came their apology. He could not but see the death of Raffles, and see in it his own deliverance. What was the removal of this wretched creature? He was impenitent, but were not public criminals impenitent, yet the law decided on their fate. Should providence in this case award death, there was no sin in contemplating death as the desirable issue, if he kept his hands from hastening it, if he scrupulously did what was prescribed. Even here there might be a mistake, human prescriptions were fallible things, Lydgate had said that treatment had hastened death, why not his own method of treatment? But of course intention was everything in the question of right and wrong. And Bulstrode set himself to keep his intention separate from his desire. He inwardly declared that he intended to obey orders. Why should he have got into any argument about the validity of these orders? It was only the common trick of desire which avails itself of any irrelevant skepticism, finding larger room for itself in all uncertainty about effects, in every obscurity that looks like the absence of law. Still, he did obey the orders. His anxieties continually glanced towards Lydgate, and his remembrance of what had taken place between them the morning before was accompanied with sensibilities which had not been roused at all during the actual scene. He had then cared but little about Lydgate's painful impressions with regard to the suggested change in the hospital, or about the disposition towards himself which what he held to be his justifiable refusal of a rather exorbitant request might call forth. He recurred to the scene now with a perception that he had probably made Lydgate his enemy, and with an awakened desire to propitiate him, or rather to create in him a strong sense of personal obligation. He regretted that he had not at once made even an unreasonable money sacrifice. For in case of unpleasant suspicions, or even knowledge gathered from the raving of Raffles, Bulstrode would have felt that he had a defense in Lydgate's mind by having conferred a momentous benefit on him. But the regret had perhaps come too late. Strange, piteous conflict in the soul of this unhappy man, who had longed for years to be better than he was, who had taken his selfish passions into discipline and clad them in severe robes, so that he had walked with them as a devout choir, till now that a terror had risen among them, and they could chant no longer, but threw out their common cries for safety. It was nearly the middle of the day before Lydgate arrived, he had meant to come earlier, but had been detained, he said, and his shattered looks were noticed by Balstrode. 
but he immediately threw himself into the consideration of the patient, and inquired strictly into all that had occurred. Raffles was worse, would take hardly any food, was persistently wakeful and restlessly raving, but still not violent. Contrary to Bulstrode's alarmed expectation, he took little notice of Lydgate's presence, and continued to talk or murmur incoherently. What do you think of him, said Bulstrode, in private? The symptoms are worse. You are less hopeful? No, I still think he may come round. Are you going to stay here yourself, said Lydgate, looking at Bulstrode with an abrupt question, which made him uneasy, though in reality it was not due to any suspicious conjecture. Yes, I think so, said Bulstrode, governing himself and speaking with deliberation. Mrs. Bulstrode is advised of the reasons which detain me. Mrs. Abel and her husband are not experienced enough to be left quite alone, and this kind of responsibility is scarcely included in their service of me. You have some fresh instructions, I presume. The chief new instruction that Lydgate had to give was on the administration of extremely moderate doses of opium, in case of the sleeplessness continuing after several hours. He had taken the precaution of bringing opium in his pocket, and he gave minute directions to Bulstrode as to the doses, and the point at which they should cease. He insisted on the risk of not ceasing, and repeated his order that no alcohol should be given. From what I see of the case, he ended, narcotism is the only thing I should be much afraid of. He may wear through even without much food. There's a good deal of strength in him. You look ill yourself, Mr. Lydgate, a most unusual, I may say unprecedented thing in my knowledge of you, said Bulstrode, showing a solicitude as unlike his indifference the day before, as his present recklessness about his own fatigue was unlike his habitual self-cherishing anxiety. I fear you are harassed. Yes, I am, said Lydgate, brusquely, holding his hat, and ready to go. Something new, I fear, said Bulstrode, inquiringly. Pray be seated. No, thank you, said Lydgate, with some hauteur. I mentioned to you yesterday what was the state of my affairs. There is nothing to add, except that the execution has since then been actually put into my house. One can tell a good deal of trouble in a short sentence. I will say good morning. Stay, Mr. Lydgate, stay, said Bulstrode, I have been reconsidering this subject. I was yesterday taken by surprise, and saw it superficially. Mrs. Bulstrode is anxious for her niece, and I myself should grieve at a calamitous change in your position. Claims on me are numerous, but on reconsideration, I esteem it right that I should incur a small sacrifice rather than leave you unaided. You said, I think, that a thousand pounds would suffice entirely to free you from your burthens, and enable you to recover a firm stand? Yes, said Lydgate, a great leap of joy within him surmounting every other feeling, that would pay all my debts, and leave me a little on hand. I could set about economizing in our way of living. And by and by my practice might look up. If you will wait a moment, Mr. Lydgate, I will draw a check to that amount. I am aware that help, to be effectual in these cases, should be thorough. While Bulstrode wrote, Lydgate turned to the window thinking of his home, thinking of his life with its good start saved from frustration, its good purposes still unbroken. You can give me a note of hand for this, Mr. Lydgate, said the banker, advancing towards him with the check. And by and by, I hope, you may be in circumstances gradually to repay me. Meanwhile, I have pleasure in thinking that you will be released from further difficulty. I am deeply obliged to you, said Lydgate. You have restored to me the prospect of working with some happiness and some chance of good. It appeared to him a very natural movement in Bulstrode that he should have reconsidered his refusal, it corresponded with the more munificent side of his character. But as he put his hack into a canter, that he might get the sooner home, and tell the good news to Rosamond, and get cash at the bank to pay over to Dover's agent, there crossed his mind, with an unpleasant impression, as from a dark-winged flight of evil augury across his vision, 
the thought of that contrast in himself which a few months had brought, that he should be overjoyed at being under a strong personal obligation, that he should be overjoyed at getting money for himself from Bulstrode. The banker felt that he had done something to nullify one cause of uneasiness, and yet he was scarcely the easier. He did not measure the quantity of diseased motive which had made him wish for Lydgate's goodwill, but the quantity was none the less actively there, like an irritating agent in his blood. A man vows, and yet will not cast away the means of breaking his vow. Is it that he distinctly means to break it? Not at all, but the desires which tend to break it are at work in him dimly, and make their way into his imagination, and relax his muscles in the very moments when he is telling himself over again the reasons for his vow. Raffles, recovering quickly, returning to the free use of his odious powers, how could Bulstrode wish for that? Raffles dead was the image that brought release, and indirectly he prayed for that way of release, beseeching that, if it were possible, the rest of his days here below might be freed from the threat of an ignominy which would break him utterly as an instrument of God's service. Lydgate's opinion was not on the side of promise that this prayer would be fulfilled, and as the day advanced, Bulstrode felt himself getting irritated at the persistent life in this man, whom he would fain have seen sinking into the silence of death, imperious will stirred murderous impulses towards this brute life, over which will, by itself, had no power. He said inwardly that he was getting too much worn, he would not sit up with the patient tonight, but leave him to Mrs. Abel, who, if necessary, could call her husband. At six o'clock, Raffles, having had only fitful perturbed snatches of sleep, from which he waked with fresh restlessness and perpetual cries that he was sinking away, Bulstrode began to administer the opium according to Lydgate's directions. At the end of half an hour or more he called Mrs. Abel and told her that he found himself unfit for further watching. He must now consign the patient to her care, and he proceeded to repeat to her Lydgate's directions as to the quantity of each dose. Mrs. Abel had not before known anything of Lydgate's prescriptions, she had simply prepared and brought whatever Bulstrode ordered, and had done what he pointed out to her. She began now to ask what else she should do besides administering the opium. Nothing at present, except the offer of the soup or the soda water, you can come to me for further directions. Unless there is any important change, I shall not come into the room again tonight. You will ask your husband for help if necessary. I must go to bed early. You've much need, sir, I'm sure, said Mrs. Abel, and to take something more strengthening than what you've done. Bulstrode went away now without anxiety as to what Raffles might say in his raving, which had taken on a muttering incoherence not likely to create any dangerous belief. At any rate he must risk this. He went down into the wainscoted parlor first, and began to consider whether he would not have his horse saddled and go home by the moonlight, and give up caring for earthly consequences. Then, he wished that he had begged Lydgate to come again that evening. Perhaps he might deliver a different opinion, and think that Raffles was getting into a less hopeful state. Should he send for Lydgate? If Raffles were really getting worse, and slowly dying, Bulstrode felt that he could go to bed and sleep in gratitude to Providence. But was he worse? Lydgate might come and simply say that he was going on as he expected, and predict that he would by and by fall into a good sleep, and get well. What was the use of sending for him? Bulstrode shrank from that result. No ideas or opinions could hinder him from seeing the one probability to be, that Raffles recovered would be just the same man as before, with his strength as a tormentor renewed, obliging him to drag away his wife to spend her years apart from her friends and native place, carrying an alienating suspicion against him in her heart. He had sat an hour and a half in this conflict by the firelight only, when a sudden thought made him rise and light the bed candle, which he had brought down with him. The thought was, that he had not told Mrs. Abel when the doses of opium must cease. He took hold of the candlestick, but stood motionless for a long while. She might already have given him more than Lydgate had prescribed. But it was excusable in him, that he should forget part of an order, in his present wearied condition. He walked upstairs, candle in hand, 
not knowing whether he should straightway enter his own room and go to bed, or turn to the patient's room and rectify his omission. He paused in the passage, with his face turned towards Raffles' room, and he could hear him moaning and murmuring. He was not asleep, then. Who could know that Lydgate's prescription would not be better disobeyed than followed, since there was still no sleep? He turned into his own room. Before he had quite undressed, Mrs. Abel rapped at the door, he opened it an inch, so that he could hear her speak low. If you please, sir, should I have no brandy nor nothing to give the poor creature? He feels sinking away, and nothing else will he swallow, and but little strength in it, if he did, only the opium. And he says more and more he's sinking down through the earth. To her surprise, Mr. Bulstrode did not answer. A struggle was going on within him. I think he must die for want o' oh, support, if he goes on in that way. When I nursed my poor master, Mr. Robison, I had to give him port wine and brandy constant, and a big glass at a time, added Mrs. Abel, with a touch of remonstrance in her tone. But again Mr. Bulstrode did not answer immediately, and she continued, It's not a time to spare when people are at death's door, nor would you wish it, sir, I'm sure. Else I should give him our own bottle o' oh, rum as we keep by us. But a sitter up so as you've been, and doing everything as laid in your power, here a key was thrust through the inch of doorway, and Mr. Bulstrode said huskily, that is the key of the wine cooler. You will find plenty of brandy there. Early in the morning, about six, Mr. Bulstrode rose and spent some time in prayer. Does anyone suppose that private prayer is necessarily candid, necessarily goes to the roots of action? Private prayer is a nautable speech, and speech is representative, who can represent himself just as he is, even in his own reflections. Bulstrode had not yet unraveled in his thought the confused promptings of the last four and twenty hours. He listened in the passage, and could hear hard stertorous breathing. Then he walked out in the garden, and looked at the early rime on the grass and fresh spring leaves. When he re-entered the house, he felt startled at the sight of Mrs. Abel. How is your patient, asleep, I think, he said, with an attempt at cheerfulness in his tone. He's gone very deep, sir, said Mrs. Abel. He went off gradual between three and four o'clock. Would you please to go and look at him? I thought it no harm to leave him. My man's gone afield, and the little girl's seeing to the kettles. Bulstrode went up. At a glance he knew that Raffles was not in the sleep which brings revival, but in the sleep which streams deeper and deeper into the gulf of death. He looked round the room and saw a bottle with some brandy in it, and the almost empty opium phial. He put the phial out of sight, and carried the brandy bottle downstairs with him, locking it again in the wine cooler. While breakfasting he considered whether he should ride to Middlemarch at once, or wait for Lydgate's arrival. He decided to wait, and told Mrs. Abel that she might go about her work, he could watch in the bedchamber. As he sat there and beheld the enemy of his peace going irrevocably into silence, he felt more at rest than he had done for many months. His conscience was soothed by the enfolding wing of secrecy, which seemed just then like an angel sent down for his relief. He drew out his pocket book to review various memoranda there as to the arrangements he had projected and partly carried out in the prospect of quitting Middlemarch, and considered how far he would let them stand or recall them, now that his absence would be brief. Some economies which he felt desirable might still find a suitable occasion in his temporary withdrawal from management, and he hoped still that Mrs. Kasabin would take a large share in the expenses of the hospital. In that way the moments passed, until a change in the stertorous breathing was marked enough to draw his attention wholly to the bed, and forced him to think of the departing life, which had once been subservient to his own, which he had once been glad to find base enough for him to act on as he would. It was his gladness then which impelled him now to be glad that the life was at an end. And who could say that the death of Raffles had been hastened? Who knew what would have saved him? Lydgate arrived at half-past ten, in time to witness the final pause of the breath. 
When he entered the room Bulstrode observed a sudden expression in his face, which was not so much surprise as a recognition that he had not judged correctly. He stood by the bed in silence for some time, with his eyes turned on the dying man, but with that subdued activity of expression which showed that he was carrying on an inward debate. When did this change begin? said he, looking at Bulstrode. I did not watch by him last night, said Bulstrode. I was overworn, and left him under Mrs. Abel's care. She said that he sank into sleep between three and four o'clock. When I came in before eight he was nearly in this condition. Lydgate did not ask another question, but watched in silence until he said, It's all over. This morning Lydgate was in a state of recovered hope and freedom. He had set out on his work with all his old animation, and felt himself strong enough to bear all the deficiencies of his married life. And he was conscious that Bulstrode had been a benefactor to him. But he was uneasy about this case. He had not expected it to terminate as it had done. Yet he hardly knew how to put a question on the subject to Bulstrode without appearing to insult him, and if he examined the housekeeper, why, the man was dead. There seemed to be no use in implying that somebody's ignorance or imprudence had killed him. And after all, he himself might be wrong. He and Bulstrode rode back to Middlemarch together, talking of many things, chiefly cholera and the chances of the reform bill in the House of Lords, and the firm resolve of the political unions. Nothing was said about Raffles, except that Bulstrode mentioned the necessity of having a grave for him in Lowick Churchyard, and observed that, so far as he knew, the poor man had no connections, except Rig, whom he had stated to be unfriendly towards him. On returning home Lydgate had a visit from Mr. Fairbrother. The vicar had not been in the town the day before, but the news that there was an execution in Lydgate's house had got to Lowick by the evening, having been carried by Mr. Spicer, shoemaker and parish clerk, who had it from his brother, the respectable bell hanger in Lowick Gate. Since that evening when Lydgate had come down from the billiard room with Fred Vincey, Mr. Fairbrother's thoughts about him had been rather gloomy. Playing at the Green Dragon once or oftener might have been a trifle in another man, but in Lydgate it was one of several signs that he was getting unlike his former self. He was beginning to do things for which he had formerly even an excessive scorn. Whatever certain dissatisfactions in marriage, which some silly tinklings of gossip had given him hints of, might have to do with this change, Mr. Fairbrother felt sure that it was chiefly connected with the debts which were being more and more distinctly reported, and he began to fear that any notion of Lydgate's having resources or friends in the background must be quite illusory. The rebuff he had met with in his first attempt to win Lydgate's confidence, disinclined him to a second, but this news of the execution being actually in the house, determined the vicar to overcome his reluctance. Lydgate had just dismissed a poor patient, in whom he was much interested, and he came forward to put out his hand, with an open cheerfulness which surprised Mr. Fairbrother. Could this too be a proud rejection of sympathy and help? Never mind, the sympathy and help should be offered. How are you, Lydgate? I came to see you because I had heard something which made me anxious about you, said the vicar, in the tone of a good brother, only that there was no reproach in it. They were both seated by this time, and Lydgate answered immediately, I think I know what you mean. You had heard that there was an execution in the house? Yes, is it true? It was true, said Lydgate, with an air of freedom, as if he did not mind talking about the affair now. But the danger is over, the debt is paid. I am out of my difficulties now, I shall be freed from debts, and able, I hope, to start afresh on a better plan. I am very thankful to hear it, said the vicar, falling back in his chair, and speaking with that low-toned quickness which often follows the removal of a load. I like that better than all the news in the Times. I confess I came to you with a heavy heart. Thank you for coming, said Lydgate cordially. I can enjoy the kindness all the more because I am happier. I have certainly been a good deal crushed. I'm afraid I shall find the bruises still painful by and by, he added, smiling rather sadly, but just now I can only feel that the torture screw is off. 
Mr. Fairbrother was silent for a moment, and then said earnestly, My dear fellow, let me ask you one question. Forgive me if I take a liberty. I don't believe you will ask anything that ought to offend me. Then, this is necessary to set my heart quite at rest, you have not, have you, in order to pay your debts, incurred another debt which may harass you worse hereafter? No, said Lydgate, coloring slightly. There is no reason why I should not tell you, since the fact is so, that the person to whom I am indebted is Bulstrode. He has made me a very handsome advance, a thousand pounds, and he can afford to wait for repayment. Well, that is generous, said Mr. Fairbrother, compelling himself to approve of the man whom he disliked. His delicate feeling shrank from dwelling even in his thought on the fact that he had always urged Lydgate to avoid any personal entanglement with Bulstrode. He added immediately, and Bulstrode must naturally feel an interest in your welfare, after you have worked with him in a way which has probably reduced your income instead of adding to it. I am glad to think that he has acted accordingly. Lydgate felt uncomfortable under these kindly suppositions. They made more distinct within him the uneasy consciousness which had shown its first dim stirrings only a few hours before, that Bulstrode's motives for his sudden beneficence following close upon the chillest indifference might be merely selfish. He let the kindly suppositions pass. He could not tell the history of the loan, but it was more vividly present with him than ever, as well as the fact which the vicar delicately ignored, that this relation of personal indebtedness to Bulstrode was what he had once been most resolved to avoid. He began, instead of answering, to speak of his projected economies, and of his having come to look at his life from a different point of view. I shall set up a surgery, he said. I really think I made a mistaken effort in that respect. And if Rosamond will not mind, I shall take an apprentice. I don't like these things, but if one carries them out faithfully they are not really lowering. I have had a severe galling to begin with, that will make the small rubs seem easy. Poor Lydgate. The, if Rosamond will not mind, which had fallen from him involuntarily as part of his thought, was a significant mark of the yoke he bore. But Mr. Fairbrother, whose hopes entered strongly into the same current with Lydgate's, and who knew nothing about him that could now raise a melancholy presentiment, left him with affectionate congratulation. Chapter 71 Clown T'was in the bunch of grapes, where, indeed, you have a delight to sit, have you not? Froth. I have so, because it is an open room, and good for winter. C.L.O. Why, very well then, I hope here be truths. Measure for measure. Five days after the death of Raffles, Mr. Bambridge was standing at his leisure under the large archway leading into the yard of the Green Dragon. He was not fond of solitary contemplation, but he had only just come out of the house, and any human figure standing at ease under the archway in the early afternoon was as certain to attract companionship as a pigeon which has found something worth pecking at. In this case there was no material object to feed upon, but the eye of reason saw a probability of mental sustenance in the shape of gossip. Mr. Hopkins, the meek-mannered draper opposite, was the first to act on this inward vision, being the more ambitious of a little masculine talk because his customers were chiefly women. Mr. Bambridge was rather curt to the draper, feeling that Hopkins was of course glad to talk to him, but that he was not going to waste much of his talk on Hopkins. Soon, however, there was a small cluster of more important listeners, who were either deposited from the passers-by, or had sauntered to the spot expressly to see if there were anything going on at the Green Dragon, and Mr. Bambridge was finding it worth his while to say many impressive things about the fine studs he had been seeing and the purchases he had made on a journey in the north from which he had just returned. Gentlemen present were assured that when they could show him anything to cut out a blood mare, a bay, rising for, which was to be seen at Doncaster if they chose to go and look at it, Mr. Bambridge would gratify them by being shot, from here to Hereford. Also, a pair of blacks which he was going to put into the break recalled vividly to his mind a pair which he had sold to Faulkner in 19, for a hundred guineas, and which Faulkner had sold for a hundred and sixty-two months later, 
any gent who could disprove this statement being offered the privilege of calling Mr. Bambridge by a very ugly name until the exercise made his throat dry. When the discourse was at this point of animation, came up Mr. Frank Hawley. He was not a man to compromise his dignity by lounging at the Green Dragon, but happening to pass along the high street and seeing Bambridge on the other side, he took some of his long strides across to ask the horse dealer whether he had found the first-rate gig horse which he had engaged to look for. Mr. Hawley was requested to wait until he had seen a grey selected at Bilkley, if that did not meet his wishes to a hare, Bambridge did not know a horse when he saw it, which seemed to be the highest conceivable unlikelihood. Mr. Hawley, standing with his back to the street, was fixing a time for looking at the grey and seeing it tried, when a horseman passed slowly by. Bulstrode, said two or three voices at once in a low tone, one of them, which was the drapers, respectfully prefixing the Mr., but nobody having more intention in this interjectural naming than if they had said, the Rivers Ton coach, when that vehicle appeared in the distance. Mr. Hawley gave a careless glance round at Bulstrode's back, but as Bambridge's eyes followed it he made a sarcastic grimace. By Jingo! That reminds me, he began, lowering his voice a little, I picked up something else at Bilkley besides your gig horse, Mr. Hawley. I picked up a fine story about Bulstrode. Do you know how he came by his fortune? Any gentleman wanting a bit of curious information, I can give it him free of expense. If everybody got their deserts, Bulstrode might have had to say his prayers at Botany Bay. What do you mean, said Mr. Hawley, thrusting his hands into his pockets, and pushing a little forward under the archway. If Bulstrode should turn out to be a rascal, Frank Hawley had a prophetic soul. I had it from a party who was an old chum of Bulstrode's. I'll tell you where I first picked him up, said Bambridge, with a sudden gesture of his forefinger. He was at Larcher's sale, but I knew nothing of him then, he slipped through my fingers, was after Bulstrode, no doubt. He tells me he can tap Bulstrode to any amount, knows all his secrets. However, he blabbed to me at Bilkley, he takes a stiff glass. Damn if I think he meant to turn King's evidence, but he's that sort of bragging fellow, the bragging runs over hedge and ditch with him, till he'd brag of a spavin as if it, you'd fetch money. A man should know when to pull up. Mr. Bambridge made this remark with an air of disgust, satisfied that his own bragging showed a fine sense of the marketable. What's the man's name? Where can he be found, said Mr. Hawley. As to where he is to be found, I left him to it at the Saracen's head, but his name is Raffles. Raffles, exclaimed Mr. Hopkins. I furnished his funeral yesterday. He was buried at Lowick. Mr. Bulstrode followed him. A very decent funeral. There was a strong sensation among the listeners. Mr. Bambridge gave an ejaculation in which brimstone was the mildest word, and Mr. Hawley, knitting his brows and bending his head forward, exclaimed, What, where did the man die? At Stone Court, said the draper. The housekeeper said he was a relation of the master's. He came there ill on Friday. Why, it was on Wednesday I took a glass with him, interposed Bambridge. Did any doctor attend him, said Mr. Hawley, yes. Mr. Lydgate. Mr. Bulstrode sat up with him one night. He died the third morning. Go on, Bambridge, said Mr. Hawley, insistently. What did this fellow say about Bulstrode? The group had already become larger, the town clerk's presence being a guarantee that something worth listening to was going on there, and Mr. Bambridge delivered his narrative in the hearing of seven. It was mainly what we know, including the fact about Will Ladislaw, with some local color and circumstance added, it was what Bulstrode had dreaded the betrayal of, and hoped to have buried forever with the corpse of Raffles, it was that haunting ghost of his earlier life which as he rode past the archway of the green dragon he was trusting that Providence had delivered him from. Yes, Providence. He had not confessed to himself yet that he had done anything in the way of contrivance to this end, he had accepted what seemed to have been offered. 
It was impossible to prove that he had done anything which hastened the departure of that man's soul. But this gossip about Bulstrode spread through Middlemarch like the smell of fire. Mr. Frank Hawley followed up his information by sending a clerk whom he could trust to Stone Court on a pretext of inquiring about Hay, but really to gather all that could be learned about Raffles and his illness from Mrs. Abel. In this way it came to his knowledge that Mr. Garth had carried the man to Stone Court in his gig, and Mr. Hawley in consequence took an opportunity of seeing Caleb, calling at his office to ask whether he had time to undertake an arbitration if it were required, and then asking him incidentally about Raffles. Caleb was betrayed into no word injurious to Bulstrode beyond the fact which he was forced to admit, that he had given up acting for him within the last week. Mr. Hawley drew his inferences, and feeling convinced that Raffles had told his story to Garth, and that Garth had given up Bulstrode's affairs in consequence, said so a few hours later to Mr. Toller. The statement was passed on until it had quite lost the stamp of an inference, and was taken as information coming straight from Garth, so that even a diligent historian might have concluded Caleb to be the chief publisher of Bulstrode's misdemeanors. Mr. Hawley was not slow to perceive that there was no handle for the law either in the revelations made by Raffles or in the circumstances of his death. He had himself ridden to Lowick Village that he might look at the register and talk over the whole matter with Mr. Fairbrother, who was not more surprised than the lawyer that an ugly secret should have come to light about Bulstrode, though he had always had justice enough in him to hinder his antipathy from turning into conclusions. But while they were talking another combination was silently going forward in Mr. Fairbrother's mind, which foreshadowed what was soon to be loudly spoken of in Middlemarch as a necessary putting of two and two together. With the reasons which kept Bulstrode in dread of Raffles there flashed the thought that the dread might have something to do with his munificence towards his medical man, and though he resisted the suggestion that it had been consciously accepted in any way as a bribe, he had a foreboding that this complication of things might be of malignant effect on Lydgate's reputation. He perceived that Mr. Hawley knew nothing at present of the sudden relief from debt, and he himself was careful to glide away from all approaches towards the subject. Well, he said, with a deep breath, wanting to wind up the illimitable discussion of what might have been, though nothing could be legally proven, it is a strange story. So our mercurial latest law has a queer genealogy. A high-spirited young lady and a musical Polish patriot made a likely enough stock for him to spring from, but I should never have suspected a grafting of the Jew pawnbroker. However, there's no knowing what a mixture will turn out beforehand. Some sorts of dirt serve to clarify. It's just what I should have expected, said Mr. Hawley, mounting his horse. Any cursed alien blood, Jew, Corsican, or Gypsy. I know he's one of your black sheep, Hawley. But he is really a disinterested, unworldly fellow, said Mr. Fairbrother, smiling. Aye, aye, that is your Whiggish twist, said Mr. Hawley who had been in the habit of saying apologetically that Fairbrother was such a damned pleasant good-hearted fellow you would mistake him for a Tory. Mr. Hawley rode home without thinking of Lydgate's attendance on Raffles in any other light than as a piece of evidence on the side of Bulstrode. But the news that Lydgate had all at once become able not only to get rid of the execution in his house but to pay all his debts in Middlemarch was spreading fast, gathering round it conjectures and comments which gave it new body and impetus, and soon filling the ears of other persons besides Mr. Hawley, who were not slow to see a significant relation between this sudden command of money and Bulstrode's desire to stifle the scandal of Raffles. That the money came from Bulstrode would infallibly have been guessed even if there had been no direct evidence of it, for it had beforehand entered into the gossip about Lydgate's affairs, that neither his father-in-law nor his own family would do anything for him, and direct evidence was furnished not only by a clerk at the bank, but by innocent Mrs. Bulstrode herself, who mentioned the loan to Mrs. Plymdale, who mentioned it to her daughter-in-law of the house of Toller, who mentioned it. Generally. The business was felt to be so public and important that it required dinners to feed it, and many invitations were just then issued and accepted on the strength of this scandal concerning Bulstrode and Lydgate, wives, widows, and single ladies took their work and went out to tea oftener than usual, and all public conviviality, 
from the green dragon to dollops, gathered a zest which could not be won from the question whether the lords would throw out the reform bill. For hardly anybody doubted that some scandalous reason or other was at the bottom of Bulstrode's liberality to Lydgate. Mr. Hawley indeed, in the first instance, invited a select party, including the two physicians, with Mr. Toller and Mr. Wrench, expressly to hold a close discussion as to the probabilities of Raffles' illness, reciting to them all the particulars which had been gathered from Mrs. Abel in connection with Lydgate's certificate, that the death was due to delirium tremens, and the medical gentlemen, who all stood undisturbedly on the old paths in relation to this disease, declared that they could see nothing in these particulars which could be transformed into a positive ground of suspicion. But the moral grounds of suspicion remained, the strong motives Bulstrode clearly had for wishing to be rid of Raffles, and the fact that at this critical moment he had given Lydgate the help which he must for some time have known the need for, the disposition, moreover, to believe that Bulstrode would be unscrupulous, and the absence of any indisposition to believe that Lydgate might be as easily bribed as other haughty-minded men when they have found themselves in want of money. Even if the money had been given merely to make him hold his tongue about the scandal of Bulstrode's earlier life, the fact threw an odious light on Lydgate, who had long been sneered at as making himself subservient to the banker for the sake of working himself into predominance, and discrediting the elder members of his profession. Hence, in spite of the negative as to any direct sign of guilt in relation to the death at Stone Court, Mr. Hawley's select party broke up with the sense that the affair had an ugly look. But this vague conviction of indeterminable guilt, which was enough to keep up much head-shaking and biting innuendo even among substantial professional seniors, had for the general mind all the superior power of mystery over fact. Everybody liked better to conjecture how the thing was, than simply to know it, for conjecture soon became more confident than knowledge, and had a more liberal allowance for the incompatible. Even the more definite scandal concerning Bulstrode's earlier life was, for some minds, melted into the mass of mystery, as so much lively metal to be poured out in dialogue, and to take such fantastic shapes as heaven pleased. This was the tone of thought chiefly sanctioned by Mrs. Dollop, the spirited landlady of the tankard in Slaughter Lane, who had often to resist the shallow pragmatism of customers disposed to think that their reports from the outer world were of equal force with what had come up in her mind. How it had been brought to her she didn't know, but it was there before her as if it had been scored with the chalk on the chimney board, as Bulstrode should say, his inside was that black as if the hairs of his head knowed the thoughts of his heart, he'd tear em up by the roots. That's odd, said Mr. Limp, a meditative shoemaker, with weak eyes and a piping voice. Why, I read in the th trumpet that was what the Duke of Wellington said when he turned his coat and went over to the Romans. Very like, said Mrs. Dollop. If one rascal said it, it's more reason why another should. But hypocrite as he's been, and holding things with that high hand, as there was no parson I, the country good enough for him, he was forced to take old Harry into his counsel and old Harry's been too many for him. I, I, he's a, complice you can't send out oh, the country, said Mr. Crabbe, the glazier, who gathered much news and groped among it dimly. But by what I can make out, there's them says Bulstrode was for running away, for fear oh, being found out, before now. He'll be drove away, whether or no, said Mr. Dill, the barber, who had just dropped in. I shaved Fletcher, Holly's clerk, this morning, he's got a bad finger, and he says they're all of one mind to get rid of Bulstrode. Mr. Thesiger is turned against him, and wants him out o' oh, the parish. And there's gentlemen in this town says they'd as soon dine with a fellow from the hulks. And a deal sooner I would, says Fletcher, for what's more against one's stomach than a man coming and making himself bad company with his religion, and giving out as the Ten Commandments are not enough for him, and all the while he's worse than half the men at the treadmill? Fletcher said so himself. It'll be a bad thing for the town though, if Bulstrode's money goes out of it, said Mr. Limp, quaveringly. Ah, there's better folks spend their money worse, said a firm-voiced dyer, whose crimson hands looked out of keeping with his good-natured face. 
But he won't keep his money, by what I can make out, said the glazier. Don't they say as there somebody can strip it off him? By what I can understand, they could take every penny off him, if they went to lawing. No such thing, said the barber, who felt himself a little above his company at Dollops, but liked it none the worse. Fletcher says it's no such thing. He says they might prove over and over again whose child this young Ladislaw was, and they'd do no more than if they proved I came out of the fens, he couldn't touch a penny. Look you there now, said Mrs. Dollop, indignantly. I thank the Lord he took my children to himself, if that's all the law can do for the motherless. Then by that, it's oh, no use who your father and mother is. But as to listening to what one lawyer says without asking another, I wonder at a man oh, your cleverness, Mr. Dill. It's well known there's always two sides, if no more, else who'd go to law, I should like to know. It's a poor tale, with all the law as there is up and down, if it's no use proving whose child you are. Fletcher may say that if he likes, but I say, don't Fletcher me. Mr. Dill affected to laugh in a complimentary way at Mrs. Dollop, as a woman who was more than a match for the lawyers, being disposed to submit to much twitting from a landlady who had a long score against him. If they come to lawing, and it's all true as folks say, there's more to be looked to nor money, said the glazier. There's this poor creeter as is dead and gone, by what I can make out, he'd seen the day when he was a deal finer gentleman nor Bolstrode. Finer gentleman. I'll warrant him, said Mrs. Dollop, and a far personabler man, by what I can hear. As I said when Mr. Baldwin, the tax gatherer, comes in, a standing where you sit, and says, Bolstrode got all his money as he brought into this town by thieving and swindling, I said, you don't make me no wiser, Mr. Baldwin, it set my blood a creeping to look at him ever sin, here he came into slaughter lane a wanting to buy the house over my head, folks don't look the color oh, the dough tub and stare at you as if they wanted to see into your backbone for nothing. That was what I said, and Mr. Baldwin can bear me witness. And in the rights of it too, said Mr. Crabbe. For by what I can make out, this Raffles, as they call him, was a lusty, fresh-colored man as you'd wish to see, and the best o oh, company, though dead he lies in Lowick churchyard sure enough, and by what I can understand, there's them knows more than they should know about how he got there. I'll believe you, said Mrs. Dollop, with a touch of scorn at Mr. Crabbe's apparent dimness. When a man's been, ties to a lone house, and there's them can pay for hospitals and nurses for half the countryside choose to be sitters up night and day, and nobody to come near but a doctor as is known to stick at nothing, and as poor as he can hang together, and after that so flush o oh, money as he can pay off Mr. Biles the butcher as his bill has been running on for the best o oh, joints since last Michaelmas was a twelvemonth. I don't want anybody to come and tell me as there's been more. Going on nor the prayer books got a service for, I don't want to stand winking and blinking and thinking. Mrs. Dollop looked round with the air of a landlady accustomed to dominate her company. There was a chorus of adhesion from the more courageous, but Mr. Limp, after taking a draught, placed his flat hands together and pressed them hard between his knees, looking down at them with blear-eyed contemplation, as if the scorching power of Mrs. Dollop's speech had quite dried up and nullified his wits until they could be brought round again by further moisture. Why shouldn't they dig the man up and have the crowner, said the dyer. It's been done many and many's the time. If there's been foul play they might find it out. Not they, Mr. Jonas, said Mrs. Dollop, emphatically. I know what doctors are. They're a deal too cunning to be found out. And this Dr. Lydgate that's been for cutting up everybody before the breath was well out oh, their body, it's plain enough what use he wanted to make oh looking into respectable people's insides. He knows drugs, you may be sure, as you can neither smell nor see, neither before they're swallowed nor after. Why, I've seen drops myself ordered by Dr. Gambit, as is our club doctor and a good character, and has brought more live children into the world or ever another I'd Middlemarch, I say I've seen drops myself as made no difference whether they was in the glass or out, and yet have griped you the next day. 
so I'll leave your own sense to judge. Don't tell me. All I say is, it's a mercy they didn't take this Dr. Lydgate onto our club. There's many a mother's child might ha root it. The heads of this discussion at Dollops had been the common theme among all classes in the town, had been carried to Lowick Parsonage on one side and to Tipton Grange on the other, had come fully to the ears of the Vinci family, and had been discussed with sad reference to poor Harriet by all Mrs. Bulstrode's friends, before Lydgate knew distinctly why people were looking strangely at him, and before Bulstrode himself suspected the betrayal of his secrets. He had not been accustomed to very cordial relations with his neighbors, and hence he could not miss the signs of cordiality, moreover, he had been taking journeys on business of various kinds, having now made up his mind that he need not quit Middlemarch, and feeling able consequently to determine on matters which he had before left in suspense. We will make a journey to Cheltenham in the course of a month or two, he had said to his wife. There are great spiritual advantages to be had in that town along with the air and the waters, and six weeks there will be eminently refreshing to us. He really believed in the spiritual advantages, and meant that his life henceforth should be the more devoted because of those later sins which he represented to himself as hypothetic, praying hypothetically for their pardon, if I have herein transgressed. As to the hospital, he avoided saying anything further to Lydgate, fearing to manifest a too sudden change of plans immediately on the death of Raffles. In his secret soul he believed that Lydgate suspected his orders to have been intentionally disobeyed, and suspecting this he must also suspect a motive. But nothing had been betrayed to him as to the history of Raffles, and Bulstrode was anxious not to do anything which would give emphasis to his undefined suspicions. As to any certainty that a particular method of treatment would either save or kill, Lydgate himself was constantly arguing against such dogmatism, he had no right to speak, and he had every motive for being silent. Hence Bulstrode felt himself providentially secured. The only incident he had strongly winced under had been an occasional encounter with Caleb Garth, who, however, had raised his hat with mild gravity. Meanwhile, on the part of the principal townsman a strong determination was growing against him. A meeting was to be held in the town hall on a sanitary question which had risen into pressing importance by the occurrence of a cholera case in the town. Since the Act of Parliament, which had been hurriedly passed, authorizing assessments for sanitary measures, there had been a board for the superintendents of such measures appointed in Middlemarch, and much cleansing and preparation had been concurred in by Whigs and Tories. The question now was, whether a piece of ground outside the town should be secured as a burial ground by means of assessment or by private subscription. The meeting was to be open, and almost everybody of importance in the town was expected to be there. Mr. Bulstrode was a member of the board, and just before twelve o'clock he started from the bank with the intention of urging the plan of private subscription. Under the hesitation of his projects, he had for some time kept himself in the background, and he felt that he should this morning resume his old position as a man of action and influence in the public affairs of the town where he expected to end his days. Among the various persons going in the same direction, he saw Lydgate, they joined, talked over the object of the meeting, and entered it together. It seemed that everybody of Mark had been earlier than they. But there were still spaces left near the head of the large central table, and they made their way thither. Mr. Fairbrother sat opposite, not far from Mr. Hawley, all the medical men were there, Mr. Thesiger was in the chair, and Mr. Brooke of Tipton was on his right hand. Lydgate noticed a peculiar interchange of glances when he and Bulstrode took their seats. After the business had been fully opened by the chairman, who pointed out the advantages of purchasing by subscription a piece of ground large enough to be ultimately used as a general cemetery, Mr. Bulstrode, whose rather high-pitched but subdued and fluent voice the town was used to at meetings of this sort, rose and asked leave to deliver his opinion. Lydgate could see again the peculiar interchange of glances before Mr. Hawley started up, and said in his firm resonant voice, Mr. Chairman, I request that before anyone delivers his opinion on this point I may be permitted to speak on a question of public feeling, which not only by myself, but by many gentlemen present, 
is regarded as preliminary. Mr. Hawley's mode of speech, even when public decorum repressed his awful language, was formidable in its curtness and self-possession. Mr. Thess Iger sanctioned the request, Mr. Bolstrode sat down, and Mr. Hawley continued. In what I have to say, Mr. Chairman, I am not speaking simply on my own behalf, I am speaking with the concurrence and at the express request of no fewer than eight of my fellow townsmen, who are immediately around us. It is our united sentiment that Mr. Bolstrode should be called upon, and I do now call upon him, to resign public positions which he holds not simply as a taxpayer, but as a gentleman among gentlemen. There are practices and there are acts which, owing to circumstances, the law cannot visit, though they may be worse than many things which are legally punishable. Honest men and gentlemen, if they don't want the company of people who perpetrate such acts, have got to defend themselves as they best can, and that is what I and the friends whom I may call my clients in this affair are determined to do. I don't say that Mr. Bolstrode has been guilty of shameful acts, but I call upon him either publicly to deny and confute the scandalous statements made against him by a man now dead, and who died in his house, the statement that he was for many years engaged in nefarious practices, and that he won his fortune by dishonest procedures, or else to withdraw from positions which could only have been allowed him as a gentleman among gentlemen. All eyes in the room were turned on Mr. Bolstrode, who, since the first mention of his name, had been going through a crisis of feeling almost too violent for his delicate frame to support. Lydgate, who himself was undergoing a shock as from the terrible practical interpretation of some faint augury, felt, nevertheless, that his own movement of resentful hatred was checked by that instinct of the healer which thinks first of bringing rescue or relief to the sufferer, when he looked at the shrunken misery of Bulstrode's livid face. The quick vision that his life was after all a failure, that he was a dishonored man, and must quail before the glance of those towards whom he had habitually assumed the attitude of a reprover, that God had disowned him before men and left him unscreened to the triumphant scorn of those who were glad to have their hatred justified, the sense of utter futility in that equivocation with his conscience in dealing with the life of his accomplice, an equivocation which now turned venomously upon him. With the full-grown fong of a discovered lie, all this rushed through him like the agony of terror which fails to kill, and leaves the ears still open to the returning wave of execration. The sudden sense of exposure after the re-established sense of safety came, not to the coarse organization of a criminal, but to the susceptible nerve of a man whose intensest being lay in such mastery and predominance as the conditions of his life had shaped for him. But in that intense being lay the strength of reaction. Through all his bodily infirmity there ran a tenacious nerve of ambitious self-preserving will, which had continually leaped out like a flame, scattering all doctrinal fears, and which, even while he sat an object of compassion for the merciful, was beginning to stir and glow under his ashy paleness. Before the last words were out of Mr. Hawley's mouth, Bolstrode felt that he should answer, and that his answer would be a retort. He dared not get up and say, I am not guilty, the whole story is false, even if he had dared this, it would have seemed to him, under his present keen sense of betrayal, as vain as to pull, for covering to his nakedness, a frail rag which would rend at every little strain. For a few moments there was total silence, while every man in the room was looking at Bulstrode. He sat perfectly still, leaning hard against the back of his chair, he could not venture to rise, and when he began to speak he pressed his hands upon the seat on each side of him. But his voice was perfectly audible, though hoarser than usual, and his words were distinctly pronounced, though he paused between sentence as if short of breath. He said, turning first toward Mr. Thess Iger, and then looking at Mr. Hawley, I protest before you, sir, as a Christian minister, against the sanction of proceedings towards me which are dictated by virulent hatred. Those who are hostile to me are glad to believe any libel uttered by a loose tongue against me and their consciences become strict against me. Say that the evil speaking of which I am to be made the victim accuses me of malpractices, here Bolstrode's voice rose and took on a more biting accent, till it seemed a low cry, who shall be my accuser? Not men whose own lives are unchristian, nay, scandalous, 
not men who themselves use low instruments to carry out their ends, whose profession is a tissue of chicanery, who have been spending their income on their own sensual enjoyments, while I have been devoting mine to advance the best objects with regard to this life and the next. After the word chicanery there was a growing noise, half of murmurs and half of hisses, while four persons started up at once, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Toller, Mr. Chichley, and Mr. Hackbutt, but Mr. Hawley's outburst was instantaneous, and left the others behind in silence. If you mean me, sir, I call you and every one else to the inspection of my professional life. As to Christian or unchristian, I repudiate your canting palavering Christianity, and as to the way in which I spend my income, it is not my principle to maintain thieves and cheat offspring of their due inheritance in order to support religion and set myself up as a saintly killjoy. I affect no niceness of conscience, I have not found any nice standards necessary yet to measure your actions by, sir. And I again call upon you to enter into satisfactory explanations concerning the scandals against you, or else to withdraw from posts in which we at any rate decline you as a colleague. I say, sir, we decline to cooperate with a man whose character is not cleared from infamous lights cast upon it, not only by reports but by recent actions. Allow me, Mr. Hawley, said the chairman, and Mr. Hawley, still fuming, bowed half impatiently, and sat down with his hands thrust deep in his pockets. Mr. Bulstrode, it is not desirable, I think, to prolong the present discussion, said Mr. Thesiger, turning to the pallid trembling man, I must so far concur with what has fallen from Mr. Hawley in expression of a general feeling, as to think it due to your Christian profession that you should clear yourself, if possible, from unhappy aspersions. I for my part should be willing to give you full opportunity and hearing. But I must say that your present attitude is painfully inconsistent with those principles which you have sought to identify yourself with, and for the honor of which I am bound to care. I recommend you at present, as your clergyman, and one who hopes for your reinstatement in respect, to quit the room, and avoid further hindrance to business. Bolstrode, after a moment's hesitation, took his hat from the floor and slowly rose, but he grasped the corner of the chair so totteringly that Lydgate felt sure there was not strength enough in him to walk away without support. What could he do? He could not see a man sink close to him for want of help. He rose and gave his arm to Bulstrode, and in that way led him out of the room, yet this act, which might have been one of gentle duty and pure compassion, was at this moment unspeakably bitter to him. It seemed as if he were putting his sign manual to that association of himself with Bulstrode, of which he now saw the full meaning as it must have presented itself to other minds. He now felt the conviction that this man who was leaning tremblingly on his arm, had given him the thousand pounds as a bribe, and that somehow the treatment of Raffles had been tampered with from an evil motive. The inferences were closely linked enough, the town knew of the loan, believed it to be a bribe, and believed that he took it as a bribe. Poor Lydgate, his mind struggling under the terrible clutch of this revelation, was all the while morally forced to take Mr. Bulstrode to the bank, send a man off for his carriage, and wait to accompany him home. Meanwhile the business of the meeting was dispatched, and fringed off into eager discussion among various groups concerning this affair of Bulstrode, and Lydgate. Mr. Brooke, who had before heard only imperfect hints of it, and was very uneasy that he had gone a little too far, in countenancing Bulstrode, now got himself fully informed, and felt some benevolent sadness in talking to Mr. Fairbrother about the ugly light in which Lydgate had come to be regarded. Mr. Fairbrother was going to walk back to Lowick. Step into my carriage, said Mr. Brooke. I am going round to see Mrs. Cassaubin. She was to come back from Yorkshire last night. She will like to see me, you know. So they drove along, Mr. Brooke chatting with good-natured hope that there had not really been anything black in Lydgate's behavior, a young fellow whom he had seen to be quite above the common mark, when he brought a letter from his uncle Sir Godwin. Mr. Fairbrother said little, he was deeply mournful, with a keen perception of human weakness, he could not be confident that under the pressure of humiliating needs Lydgate had not fallen below himself. When the carriage drove up to the gate of the manor, Dorothea was out on the gravel, 
and came to greet them. Well, my dear, said Mr. Brooke, we have just come from a meeting, a sanitary meeting, you know. Was Mr. Lydgate there, said Dorothea, who looked full of health and animation, and stood with her head bare under the gleaming April lights. I want to see him and have a great consultation with him about the hospital. I have engaged with Mr. Bulstrode to do so. Oh, my dear, said Mr. Brooke, we have been hearing bad news, bad news, you know. They walked through the garden towards the churchyard gate, Mr. Fairbrother wanting to go on to the parsonage, and Dorothea heard the whole sad story. She listened with deep interest, and begged to hear twice over the facts and impressions concerning Lydgate. After a short silence, pausing at the churchyard gate, and addressing Mr. Fairbrother, she said energetically, You don't believe that Mr. Lydgate is guilty of anything base? I will not believe it. Let us find out the truth and clear him.